Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the third day of our first annual international training course, online training course. Uh, we hope you all are having a good day so far, no matter what time zone you're in. Um, today, we have a full day full of discussing many different topics, and honestly, three hours does not justify the amount of detail that we would honestly like to go into for all of these topics. Um, you know, we're going to be discussing gas lift first thing this morning, and then we're going to roll into talking about a method which is commonly used for gas lift, but it can be used for multiple artificial lift types. Um, and it will be used for, you know, ultimately determining communication points in tubulars uh, or finding communication points in the well bore. It works really great for finding leaking check valves, um, holes in tubing, things of that sort. And so we're going to be talking about the dual shot method, which we'll introduce and we'll talk about utilizing it for both wired and wireless equipment. Um, then we're going to roll into plunger lift, uh, tracking plungers. And then finally, Gustavo is going to cap us off with talking about gas wells towards the end of the three hours. And, you know, as always, as we have done for the last two days, um, be sure that you're leaving your questions in the chat for us. Uh, we're going to dedicate the last 15, 10, 10 to 15 minutes for questions in the chat. So that way we can make sure we get your questions answered. And if it's something that we don't get to, we will ultimately follow up with an email. Um, but we want to make sure that we're going to get all of your questions answered during the time. And so, you know, as a reminder, uh, please follow us on LinkedIn at Echometer Company. Um, look us up. We're always posting things on LinkedIn that will keep you up with what's going on with the company and new developments. Um, and also, if you have data that you want to send Gustavo or myself, or you have an inquiry you want to reach out to us, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, we have our email addresses there so you can reach out to us. Um, feel free, you know, one of the things as we go through these trainings, um, a lot of people, especially those that are out in the field are learning to conduct the analysis for the first time, they, they have questions. And we like to be able to help you walk through that, those questions, kind of a, a, a crawl, walk, run scenario to where ultimately you'll be able to take over on your own. But we want to make sure that you feel comfortable conducting the analysis and um, in, in, in being able to, you know, can consider yourself to be artificial lift technicians, engineers, whatever capacity you serve for your organization. So with that being said this morning, because we have so much to dive into, we're going to dive into gas lift, okay? And I'm going to be leading the first, let me reshare this real quick, one moment. Okay, there we go. Uh, I'm going to be leading the first presentation um, in which we're going to be talking about the acoustic techniques to monitor and troubleshoot gas lift wells. Now, you know, this is kind of in addition to, we're going to be talking about a different lift type, of course, but this is in addition to what we covered on day one, where we were discussing uh, fluid level, we were discussing fluid level uh, measurement techniques. Um, we were talking about the methods of analysis. And in methods of analysis, we ultimately covered collar count, we covered downhole marker, and we covered the acoustic velocity. Well, when we talk about looking and monitoring and troubleshooting gas lift wells, it's really an expansion on the downhole marker method. Um, and especially some of the tools that you can use in the TAM software that make it a very, very good tool for determining using utilizing the mandrels in a gas lift well to determine the acoustic velocity profile in the gas lift well and utilizing that to determine the distance to the fluid level. So that's some of the things we're going to dive into. Now, one of the things that I wanted to introduce before we get started, and we've talked about the different equipment that you utilize when echo meter has. We talked about the remote fire gas gun. We've talked a little bit about the compact gas gun as well as the 5K gas gun. You know, commonly with most gas lift scenarios, you're dealing with high injection pressure. Uh, you know, whether it's your clean gas source that you're getting from buyback or you're getting from field, um, but there is a high high pressure gas source in which we're injecting in the tubing or the casing and ultimately to lift that well. And so one of the things that we'll talk about is that, you know, the 5K gas gun is a good gun to use when shooting gas lift wells. 
Now, it's not the only gun that can be used. You can ultimately use the remote fire gas gun. You can use it in explosion mode. But as we know, as we learned with explosion mode, you have to charge up the gun to a pressure over the, the casing pressure or whatever path that you're shooting. And so you can go through a lot of nitrogen when utilizing an explosion only gun to shoot into gas lift wells. Um, we like the flexibility of utilizing that 5K gun because you can do implosion or explosion against those higher pressures. So you have the pressure rating, but you can go either way. And so utilizing that implosion method gives you the ability to not have to carry that external gas around with you, and you can use the well's energy to create that acoustic pulse, which will ultimately allow you to take, the, take, your, take your data, to take your fluid level shots on that well. And so, you know, one of the things that we, we deal with on, our, on a regular basis is that there's a lot of gas lift used in offshore applications, which some of the time we're going to be talking about, you know, subsurface safety valves as well as some other things that are used in an offshore application. But the point that I want to make to this is that we do sell um, ATEX certified uh, equipment. So, so we have ATEX certified compact gas guns. We have ATEX certified 5K gas guns for use on offshore platforms where you have to have a class one, division one certification. So, you know, keep that in mind is that our 5K gas guns that you would utilize on those offshore platforms out there, you can get them as ATEX certified. You just need to specify that so that that way we can make sure to facilitate you. Okay, so I'm gonna finish what I'm talking about there and I'm gonna ultimately move into our discussion about how to monitor and troubleshoot gas lift wells utilizing the echo meter equipment. And so what's important is, what's important here is ultimately, you know, the question that we ask, because we deal with a lot of people that don't know what gas lift is. What is gas lift? Well, gas lift, gas lift is a mean of art, means of artificial lift. So it's a means of artificial lift that's implemented after flow ceases or to supplement the natural flow. Obviously, you would like to be able to have the gas lift valves installed before the well's production ceases, so that way you can maintain the decline curve and you don't have a gap in your decline curve. So, you know, being proactive and not reactive to installing these artificial lift systems is important to supplement that natural flow to be able to maintain the decline curve. Now, how does it work? Well, I had already mentioned that gas lift requires high pressure gas to be used and so you inject high pressure gas the either the casing annulus to casing tubing annulus or if you're using annular lift down the tubing to flow up the casing depends on your application and the amount of production that you want to use but you're using high pressure gas to lighten the fluid column above the uh, to lighten the fluid gradient and ultimately allow the well to flow on its own and in the explanation here i put from the formation into the tubing but like I alluded to, there's different methods of gas lift. So whether you're flowing annular or conventional, and we'll get into a little bit of that, um, you can go either way. But it's the, the method of using high pressure gas in order to decrease the fluid gradient to allow the well to flow naturally, to flow on its own. So one of the things that we're gonna talk about is that, you know, how does it look whenever we set up our equipment on the well and utilize an echo meter system in order to analyze a gas lift well. Now, one of the things that we've stayed on topic with is this the utilization of the TAM software. And overall, the TAM software gives you a lot more flexibility, especially when dealing with gas lift wells and on multiple fronts, but especially when dealing with gas lift wells, because in the older version of TWM, you only had the ability to input one downhole marker. You didn't have the ability to build out your wellbore overlay and then overlay that acoustic trace on top of that, that wellbore overlay. So in TAM, we have the ability to input our gas lift valve depths as well as landing nipples and other associated equipment in the well and build out that wellbore schematic and then overlay our acoustic trace. And when we're trying to determine how you know an up kick or a down kick and what correlates to it really makes it a nice feature to be able to analyze wells with a lot of changes in cross sectional area in the well bore gas lift being one of them now with this being said in the current example here you can see how we do have two remote fire gas guns on the wellhead 
And yeah, that is kind of preluding to the method that we'll talk about at the end in dual shot, but it's also signifying that you can take, and it's a good idea to take fluid level shots down the tubing and the casing when dealing with gas lift. Now, some of the things we're gonna talk about is direction of kick, and we'll get into that, um, and how the, the physical characteristics of mandrels whether you're use, utilizing side pocket mandrels or conventional mandrels actually affect the direction of kick. So we'll dive into that. Now, some of the things that we can see here is we ultimately have our wellbore schematic in which we have our gas lift valves entered, which we'll enter those, those in an example well here in a little while. Um, and those gas lift mandrels are easy to correlate to and seen by the reflections in the acoustic trace. Some of the things that we'll be able to determine is we'll be able to determine the top of the liquid level in both the tubing and the casing annulus. We'll be able to determine our tubing and kick pressure and then ultimately our flowing bottom hole pressure by taking fluid level shots on the gas lift well. Now, one of the things that I feel is very important and it goes back to some of the time that I've spent in the field and working with operators Let's, there we go. And that is the understanding of the gas lift install sheet. Okay. The gas lift install sheet is a vital tool. I believe that every operator, engineer, technician, whoever, however you describe yourself as, um, it should have in their war chest because what does it tell us? Well, it ultimately is going to give us the pressure surface close and the pressure surface opening of that particular gas lift design that's in the well. And going from that gas lift design, we can ultimately troubleshoot the well and determine what valve we should be injecting on as per the gas lift install sheet. Now, there's a few key points that I want to bring up in this gas lift install sheet. And the, from, from just the beginning, you can see that we have our gas lift valves numbered. In this particular sheet, you can see that the top number, 11, is actually the shallow, the most shallow depth. And these are workover values. And so one would be the first valve in the hole, and then ultimately working your way up the well with 11 being last. Now, typically being land dwellers, when we think of gas lift valves and we're looking at an echo meter shot, it's very easy to think, well, one is the top gas lift valve. And you can think of them either way, and you can put them in the, in the, uh, the gas lift design in, in TAM either way, because it will align them based on depth. But one of the things that can be confusing is that when you look at them in a gas lift install sheet, the number one gas lift valve is the first valve in the hole. Now, you commonly see your true vertical depth, your measured depth, as well as the port size associated with that particular gas lift valve. Now, one of the things that I want to talk about here is that you can see that our unloading valves, as well as some of our operating valves, are all 12 port size. And they all have the PSC, which is the pressure surface close, which is the pressure you expect to see at surface in which that valve would close. And then the PSO, the pressure surface open, the pressure at which that valve would open. Now, we all understand that we want to be lifting off of a single injection point. And the, modus, the, the, the method of gas lift is we're going to start injecting in the top valve. And the goal is to valve down, to lift from the lowest valve in time. Uh, every, you know, every well, every formation, it's going to, it's going to go down to that bottom gas lift valve in its own time. But the goal is to get to the, to that bottom valve. And you can see in this particular design, how we're lifting on an orifice at the bottom. And so with that orifice valve, there is no pressure surface closed. There's no pressure surface open because it's just an orifice. Once we've reached the orifice, we've ultimately achieved the point at which we want to be running this well and then we can decide how to optimize based on injection rates at that point. And so it's very important if you don't have access to your gas lift install sheets, I would recommend that you get your gas lift install sheets because it's really going to help you supplement your analysis of optimization of your gas lift wells. So for you guys that haven't seen them before, get a hold of them. Um, I know that they are available. You'll just have to speak with your engineer or the company that's providing your gas lift valves because it will be an important tool with troubleshooting your gas lift wells. Now, to kind of introduce what we're going to be talking about 
and the importance of utilizing the echo meter software as well as the, the, the acoustic fluid level techniques is that, you know, what beneficial information is going to be provided by shooting a gas lift well. And with that being said, you know, well, it's going to give us the fluid level depth with respect to the valve. Okay, so we can use our gas lift install sheet with our pressure surface open and pressure surface closed if everything's operating right to be able to determine, you know, what valve we should be on. But if we shoot a liquid level, we can actually see the top of the liquid level and determine which valve we're injecting on with respect to that valve and correlate those two values to see if they match up. Now, the second option here, the second point here is the depth of the deepest mandrel uncovered. Now, if we have a packer in the well and we've unloaded the well and we've lifted all the way down to the bottom valve and our packer's not leaking and we don't have holes in the tubulars, then we're only going to be able to ever see the deepest level ever uncovered and that fluid level should stay at that point. However, if you start to see the fluid level rising, then it could be an indication of something that is an issue in the well board, whether it's a leaking check valve, um, stuck open gas lift valve with the check valve. Uh, you know, there, there's multiple issues that could be encountered where it's important to continually monitor these liquid levels on the backside of the well or if you're annular in the tubing of the well um, that would help you troubleshoot your gas lift, okay? So we can find holes and restrictions. Uh, we talked about it on Monday with Gustavo, but ultimately what is the echo meter tool? Well, it's a tool that gives you the ability to basically see into the well bore because the changes in cross-sectional area ultimately will, will reflect depending on whether you're using implosion or explosion, but will ultimately reflect increases or decreases in cross-sectional area. And so when I say this often, but in it, and I stand by it, is that whenever you're looking at this data, it's very important to have a detailed well bore schematic. So that way you can ultimately determine what and where these changes in cross-sectional area are in the well bore and how they correlate to your up kicks and down kicks, okay? So if you have an up kick, which we learned on Monday is an increase in cross-sectional area in a portion of the well bore that you shouldn't, it could be an indication of a hole. Or if you have a restriction, say you have some scale buildup in the tubulars of the well and you have a down kick where you shouldn't be, it could be an indication of restriction of flow, okay? Uh, you can also use it to find equipment malfunctions. If you have a well bore problems or equipment malfunctions, if you have a gas lift valve that has physical characteristics different than other valves, uh, you're going to be able to be able to see that um, in the in the direction of kick, but also in the shape and overall analysis of the acoustic reflection. So, you know, one of the things that we commonly ask is there's a lot of people out there that are utilizing our equipment in ways that we may not know about. You know, one of the topics that we're going to introduce here at the end is the dual shot method. And I will tell you that that came from an individual that was in the field that was utilizing this equipment. And we said one thing, you cannot find leaking check valves with a, with a single shot echo meter shot. And he said, well, I have a method in which I can discover that. And I use this method in the field to find leaking check valves, to find holes in tubing. So one of the things that we like to challenge all of the people that are using echo meter equipment in the field is that if you have a method in which you're used in the field with success, share it with us. Let us know what it is so that way we can ultimately build out the software to facilitate and to support, and hopefully it'll benefit others. So one of the things that we're going to talk about first is direction of kick. And when we're talking about gas lift mandrels, the direction of kick will matter because what do we know? Well, we have conventional mandrels and conventional mandrels where you ultimately have, you have to pull out the entire tubing string in order to change out the gas lift valves versus side pocket mandrels. I'll go to this slide because this slide shows it a little bit better, but where you have conventional mandrels where the mandrel is permanently mounted to this, or the gas lift valve is permanently mounted to the side of the mandrel versus a side pocket mandrel to whereas the gas lift valve can be removed from inside the mandrel using slick line, or not slick line, but using wire line in a kickover tool. And so when we think about this from the perspective of an echometer fluid level shot, one of the things that we know is that 
Well, we know an increase in cross-sectional area is going to be an upkick, where a decrease in cross-sectional area is going to be a downkick, okay? And one of the things that you can do is whenever you shoot a well down the tubing, and it, you know it's got gas lift valves in it, but let's say that you're unsure whether they're side pocket or conventional, and most people know if they have side pockets, they're very expensive to run. Most of the time, you're going to know because you signed the bill for it. But, you know, what you'll see is that as you fire down the tubing, you'll have an increase in cross-sectional area, which will lead you to have an upkick. Versus if you shoot down the tubing casing annulus, this is a decrease in cross-sectional area. So you'll have a down kick. Side pocket mandrels make great markers whenever you're shooting down the tubing because you have that upkick at the increase in cross-sectional area, which you can correlate the acoustic velocity and ultimately the depth of liquid level. Whereas on conventional mandrels, when you fire down the tubing, there's not much change in cross-sectional area. There ultimately is the small ports in which the gas comes through the valve and then ultimately into the tubing, but it's not too common unless things are really quiet that you'll see any reflection from the inside of a tubing shot on a conventional mandrel. Now, one of the things that I wanna go into is let's, let's talk about the change in reflections based on side pocket mandrel. So when we fire down the tubing, we can see that the acoustic waves travels through the tubulars. And whenever we approach the point at which the side pocket mandrel increases in area, it will generate an upkick. And looking at this acoustic trace with the TAM uh, wellbore schematic in the background, we can clearly see that the increase in cross-sectional area from the side pocket mandrels is an upkick. Now, if we fire down the casing, we can clearly see that as the acoustic wave travels down the casing and we encounter the side pocket mandrel, that is gonna generate as a down kick because that is a decrease in cross-sectional area. So it's very easy to determine if you know you have sob pocket mandrels, but you can determine whether it was a tubing shot or a casing shot by the direction of kick because of how the cross how the kick is either an up kick or a down kick and based on the physical characteristics of a side pocket mandrel. Now, one of the things that is very easy and good to do in TAM is you'd like to overlay the casing and tubing shots for troubleshooting, okay? That's one of the important tools that you can utilize TAM for. And so in this particular example, it is indicated that the black acoustic trace is the tubing shot. But knowing that we're looking at side pocket mandrels, we can see that it's a clear upkick in the acoustic trace when looking at the tubing shot. And so we would be able, able to easily say, okay, well, this well was shot down the tubing and based on the direction of kick. Whereas we look at the casing shot and we can see that they're clearly down kicks in the casing shot. Now, some of the questions that you need to ask is, do the mandrel reflections line up? in this particular case that they do. You know, and are there any additional upkicks or downkicks indicating a possible hole or restriction that we don't see in the wellbore schematic? Now, in this particular example, we don't see any additional kicks in the acoustic traces that would lead us to believe that we have any holes or restrictions. Now, one of the things that, you know, I commonly talk about whenever we're, whenever I'm out traveling and teaching is that, you know, always take into account why, what is the reason for troubleshooting in the beginning? You know, is the well circulating gas? Are we not lifting fluid to surface? You know, are, do we have a reason to look for a hole up high or an injection point up high? And so always take those physical characteristics of the well into account when troubleshooting the well with an echo meter shot. You can clearly see how these tubing shots and casing shots overlaid line up up kicks from the tubing shot and then down kicks from the casing shot. Now, one of the things that you can also do when analyzing gas lift wells is that you can verify the unloading sequence. Now, truth be told, in all, in all reality, this could take a very long time. If you have a well that is depleted and you've recently worked over the well, 
you know, the unloading sequence could be pretty quick. You could go from the top valve to the lower valve in a pretty short order. However, some valves will lift for a year before they actually ever, or more, before they actually ever get to the bottom valve. And so with that being said, this could be something that you have to evaluate in your individual field if it makes sense to actually take a liquid level shots on. But whenever we're verifying the unloading sequence for a gas lift well, you can see that we have our gun attached to the casing tubing annulus. And as we continue to trickle in gas into the annulus, according to the procedure that is given to you by either your company or the gas lift valve manufacturers, we're going to take a court, we're going to take liquid level shots on a timely basis. And as we continue to push the liquid level down in the casing annulus and we valve down, as we fire these shots and uncover these mandrels, we're going to be able to see this in the acoustic trace. And as we uncover these mandrels, you can see a clear reflection from gas lift valve one, two, three, and four. And so it's a very vital tool that can, you know, that can allow you to see, you know, what valve am I operating on? But also, what's the deepest valve above the annular liquid level that I, that, you know, that I've lifted to in the past? And like I alluded to earlier, if you've got a packer in the well, you know, you, you're only going to be able to see how deep of a liquid level you, you've lifted to the bottom valve, you should not see any fluid backing back up into the casing annulus. If you do, it may be an indication of a problem, okay? So routine acoustic shots in a gas lift well are a very valuable tool to identify the unloading sequence, but to also troubleshoot. Now, it's important to also take fluid levels in a stabilized gas lift system, okay? So one of the things we know is that on a gas lift well that doesn't have a packer, and I want to specify that, that the annular liquid level should remain constant with respect to the operating valve. So we can determine and correlate with that gas lift valve install sheet is where am I operating? But one of the things that we know is oscillations in the liquid level may indicate valve operation issues or gas injection rate problems. And so you could be having issues if you have the liquid level rising and falling in the annulus. You know, one of the things that we deal with commonly, at least in hor the horizontal um, unconventional field, is multiporting due to terrain slugging. You know, um, is that an issue? And ultimately, can we solve that with different injection rate changes? So something that you can ultimately troubleshoot utilizing your equimeter equipment in order to get, try to come up with a solution. Now, we had talked about this, but if the well has a packer, the deepest liquid level indicates the deepest mandrel uncovered during the unloading process. So if my packer is leaking and fluid is coming into the annulus or I have a hole in the tubing and the annulus is full of liquid, it could be an indication of the issue that I'm encountering. You can also determine you know, whether we have wellbore integrity problems. Do I have a hole in the casing? Do I have a hole in the tubing? And you can shoot down the tubing and the casing and ultimately isolate those particular issues to determine which one it would be. For example, if I shoot down the casing annulus, the casing tubing annulus, and I have an upkick that doesn't correlate to the wellbore schematic, and then I shoot down the, the tubing and or then I shoot down the tubing and I say, see that same upkick, then it's an increase in cross-sectional area down both paths, telling me that I have a hole in the tubing. Now, if I shoot down the casing and have an upkick, but I shoot down the tubing and I don't see the same upkick, and I conduct a tubing, uh, a tubing integrity test on this well, and the tubing holds, then it could be pinpointing me to where I actually have that hole in the, in the, in, in the, in the casing in that particular example. Okay, So there's a lot of things you can use it for. Uh, we can determine our valve stuck open. Do I have a leaking packer? And then finally, do I have leaking check valves? And we're going to talk about doing and in, in analyzing that while use, utilizing the dual shot method. Now, one of the things that I want to talk about is that basically using that wellbore overlay and using utilizing the wellbore overlay, but also 
me turn it on here, um, but also using utilizing it in respect to the gas lift valves or any downhole marker that you have in the well. It's one of the advantages with TAM is that as you turn on the overlay, you've got you can build that so that you can correlate it with the reflections of the kicks in the acoustic trace. In this one, you can clearly see that gas lift valve, and I'm going to go from top to bottom, one down this time, but you can see that gas lift valves one, two are very visible and clear with the wellbore overlay turned on, whereas with it off, you can still see them, but it is a great visual reference to be able to turn on that wellbore overlay. And we'll go through an example and show you how to turn those on in the annotations. Um, by default, the, the wellbore overlay is on, but it is something that you can turn off. But as I'm showing you, it's, it's a good thing to have. There's really no reason to have that wellbore overlay turned off. So you can clearly and easily identify your gas lift valves. Now, one of the things that I want to talk about is the acoustic velocity between downhole markers. Now, downhole markers being our gas lift mandrels, okay? So utilizing these gas lift mandrels gives me the ability to accurately calculate the distance to the liquid level plus other downhole reflections, other markers in the well. Um, but and it gives me the ability to determine the echoes using the gas lift valves and the known distances from the wellheads. Well, one of the things that we're going to talk about is that there are variations in the acoustic velocity from the time that the shot is fired, ultimately to the liquid level. One of the things that Gustavo taught us on Monday is that there are three factors that determine the acoustic velocity, and that is specific gravity of the gas, temperature, and pressure. Now, in a producing well, the specific gravity of the gas is constant. However, what is changing? Well, the temperature and the pressure. And so one of the things that we see is we see the acoustic velocity increasing, the speed of which the sound wave is, is increasing, the deeper in the well bore that it goes on a producing well. And with that, gas lift valves, which you have a known depth of each valve, make great markers in which to reference the increase in acoustic velocity in a shot. Now, in this next slide, I want to briefly introduce, you know, and we talked about the acoustic velocity profiles on Tuesday, but like I said, it depends on gas composition, temperature, and pressure. And in this particular diagram, you see you have acoustic velocity on the left and pressure across the bottom, and then temperature through the colored curves. And one of the things that we can see is that this black dot here, where my red pointer is at, this is the acoustic velocity at surface. And what do we notice as we get deeper in the well? This is the acoustic velocity at 10,200 feet. Well, the acoustic velocity of the sound wave is actually increasing due to the increase in pressure and the increase in temperature, okay? And so this can be determined by utilizing the color echoes and identifying the markers during the shot. One of the things we know is that a uniform gas composition is common whenever we're flowing, and this increase, the acoustic velocity increases due to the temperature and pressure. Now, one of the things that we talked about Monday is you always want to reference the deepest marker possible, utilize the deepest collar count possible when determining the acoustic velocity, which will give you an accurate representation of the distance to the liquid level. In this particular example, we ask which marker should we choose? And so if I'm wanting to get the most average, most accurate average acoustic velocity from the beginning of the shot to the end of the shot, the marker that I should choose would be the lowest marker uncovered. And so I would want to be able to use the marker that is closest to the liquid level to get an accurate average acoustic velocity. Now, normally I would poll and ask you guys, but in this case, since we're dealing with a little bit of short on time, I'm going to go ahead and say the marker I would choose was the one that is closest to the liquid level. Now, this is a great example of showing multiple acoustic traces and how the acoustic velocity changes as we continue to move further down the well. This is a great example. And so in example one, you can see that we utilize marker number one, which gas lift valve number one, 
And by utilizing marker number one, we took the average acoustic velocity from the beginning of the shot to the top marker. And we see that our acoustic velocity was calculated at 1,355 feet per second, yielding a liquid level of 7,003 feet from surface. Now, as we stair step and as we continue to move through, utilizing one marker at a time deeper on each analysis, we finally get to the bottom marker and we see the difference. Look at the large difference in liquid levels over 400 feet based on which marker we chose to conduct the analysis. Our final acoustic velocity ended up at 1,434 feet per second utilizing that deepest marker. Whereas if we would have stuck with, let's just say the collar count method, which we'll see in an example here, and we only counted 20% of the collars, and we extrapolated that through the rest of the acoustic trace, our values would have been incorrect. So we always wanna make sure we use the deepest marker whenever we're trying to calculate the acoustic velocity, which will ultimately lead us to the most accurate liquid level depth. Now, we're gonna go through in just a minute, and we're gonna go through and we're gonna pick the markers in correspondence with the gas lafouts in an acoustic shot. One of the things that I wanna go ahead and introduce is like it says here at the top, if the acoustic velocity of outer is out of range, there's an issue. Here we can see this linear downward trend where the acoustic velocity is increasing as we get deeper. But what is this point? Well, this point is would go back to user error. The individual that was actually picking the gas lift mandrels in order to correlate to acoustic velocity picked the wrong reflection in correspondence with that particular valve. And you should see a gradual linear increase with the acoustic velocity as you pick your valves going from top to bottom. If you have a marker point that is off out of range, it could be an indication you picked the wrong gas lift valve. And we're gonna go through this in an example. Okay. Now, one of the things that we wanna talk about is I wanna give you a good example of identifying potential holes in tubing in a gas lift well. Now, if a hole in tubing is present, it could be an indicated by an upkick or an increase in cross-sectional area, okay? If we have a packerless well, it's pretty common that you'll see the liquid level actually rise to the depth of the hole, okay? And with that, most of the wells that or at least that are operated in South Texas had a packer. And so you didn't commonly see that. And so we would go by direction of kick and ultimately the reflection in the acoustic trace. Now the example does a great job explaining this because we're comparing two shots, one down the tubing and one down the casing. In the top shot, we see the tubing shot in which we see this up kick it doesn't correlate to anything in this particular wellbore schematic. Now, when we take the casing shot, we see the same reflection. When we overlay the two shots and align them by time, which we'll do that in the example, you can clearly see the upkicks appearing on the acoustic trace. So overlaying the two shots, the tubing and the casing, we're able to verify that upkick and then utilizing our conventional oil field knowledge and testing the tubing, whether we set a standing valve or by whatever means, doing a tubing integrity test, we proved that the tubing pressure, the tubing is, is failed, it has, has failed, then we can correlate that that upkick that's at about 1.6 seconds could be a potential hole in tubing. As you can see in this zoomed in view. Now, one of the things that we want to do in conclusion before we move on to dual shot is that there are is a lot of beneficial information that can be obtained through the life of a gas lift well by determining the distance to the liquid level, okay? Knowing the acoustic velocity profile of the well provides critical information when measuring gas, verifying gas composition and fluid level accuracy. We ultimately have multiple points of known depth in the well bore, which we can utilize to find our acoustic velocity profile in the well. It's seen in the gas gravity profile that we showed earlier. So 
Also, one of the things is that identifying the direction of kick across the particular mandrel can tell you what type of mandrel it is. Operating valves can be quickly identified. And then obviously troubleshooting techniques to identify downhole problems, which we're gonna dive into in this next section. Now, the next section that we're gonna be moving to is something that is quite interesting and it's called the dual shot method. So to introduce the dual shot method, I think it's important to look at this diagram. So typically with a single shot, we're attaching a gun to either the tubing or the casing, and we're ultimately gonna fire a single acoustic pulse down one of those paths. And then we're gonna utilize the reflections off the changes in cross-sectional area to ultimately come to decisions about make, that we can make in troubleshooting the well or verifying the operation of the well. With the dual shot method, you actually use two guns, whether you're using a remote fire gun and a compact gun or two 5K guns, a remote gun and a 5K gun, it doesn't matter. Okay. There are certain characteristics in which you would want to utilize, you know, a, a 5K gun versus a remote fire gun, but we can talk about that offline in more detail. So to give an example of what the dual shot is and go through the procedure of how which we would do it, first thing we need to do is we need to displace the fluid out of the tubing without changing the operating pressure on the casing, because as we established in the gas lift presentation, the pressure, the, the pressure that that valve operates on, or that valve operating is based on the pressure, the PSO, the PSC. And so we want to displace the liquid out of the tubing without changing the operating pressure of the gas lift valves on the casing annulus. So we're going to displace that fluid out of the tubing. We'll ultimately attach our guns on the wellhead. Now, one gun will be a firing gun. The other gun will be a listening gun. In this particular example, you can see how the shot was fired down the tubing. And then once we got to the point of communication or which there was a leaking check valve, the wave was able to travel back through that point and then come and, and the listening gun was able to detect it. Now, it's important that you be able to displace that fluid so that way you can see all the gas lift valves that are present in the stream. Now, in this particular example, we're, talk we're talking about utilizing a wired well analyzer, and we'll go into a little bit of why you have a lot of acoustic distortion at the beginning of the shot, and then it gets really quiet. We'll do that next, and we'll go into how this test is conducted. But it's important to note, what are we doing with dual shot? We've got two guns, we're firing on one path, we're listening on the other, okay? Now, prior to doing the dual shot, it's still important that you go and you take your single shots. Go and take a, a, a shot on the tubing. Go and take a shot on the casing. And the reason that we do this is ultimately to determine the acoustic velocity of the individual paths. If you think about it, think about your source gas. If you're getting your source gas uh, downstream of a a gas scrubber downstream of a compressor, it's going to be drier. The pressure is higher. So the acoustic velocity is going to be different because of what? Well, acoustic velocity is dependent on pressure, temperature, and gravity. And so it's important to take a shot down the tubing and a shot down the casing prior, so that way you can determine the acoustic velocity of the individual path and then average them for the dual shot analysis. Now, as you can see in the analysis in the acoustic trace here, we fired down the tubing, we listened on the casing, and when the acoustic wave was able to pass through the leaking check valve in this instance in valve eight, we were able to see the acoustic reflection from valve eight. Now, how do we conduct this using the wired well analyzer? So as you can see, we have a remote fire gas gun attached to the tubing, and we have a compact gas gun attached to the casing. We already talked about that we're going to shoot down the tubing and listen down the casing simultaneously. Now, what are we going to do? We're going to fire the tubing gas gun and send a pressure wave down the tubing, and we're going to utilize a BNC connector T, and we're going to hook up one gun to one side, the firing gun to one side, in the listening gun to other. 
Now, in all reality, what we're utilizing this for is we're tricking the TAM software into starting an acoustic trace by the millivolt increase from the fired shot. So let me back up one step. So in step two, it says we're going to unplug the tubing microphone from the T after the shot is fired. So we have both cables tied into the T. We're going to go to our liquid level module, just like we always would to fire the shot. We're going to fire the shot. We're going to fire the shot, and then we're going to unplug the fire gun so the, only the listening gun is there. The listening gun is the only one that is picking up the acoustic reflection from the fired shot. So after we unplug that, all we're listening to is the listening gun. Now, the acoustic signal that's created from tubing holes, leaking check valves, or malfunctioning gas lift valves will pass through that particular port and then ultimately be reflected on the acoustic trace. And as we discussed, you know, for calculating the depth to the listening gun, we're going to use the average acoustic velocity from the tubing shot and the casing shot that we took prior to conducting this analysis. Now, once again, I'm going to go to the image. And you can clearly see the VNC T that connects to the side of the well analyzer, which is the mic input, where we have our firing gun on one side and our listening gun on the other side. Once we fire the shot, typically these wires, they have a locking J slot mechanism, and we don't typically lock it on to the BNC connector T. We'll just push it on. Once we fire the shot, the shot was detected. We're going to push off the fire shot firing cable and only listen on the listening side. So you can see after we removed the cable when the shot was fired, now the gun is only listening. And that's how you ultimately procedurally go through and conduct the dual shot when utilizing the wired well analyzer. Now, the information that we get from this, as you can see, the black trace is the dual shot, whereas the blue trace is the previous casing shot that we took before the test was conducted. And so what we do with this is that you can see the gas lift mandrel reflections in the blue shot that correlate to the TAM overlay. And you can see that at valve eight, we have a communication point in which you can see the reflection. Now, one of the things is we continue to develop the dual shot and add in additional features in the software is that we have not seen that direction of kick actually correlates in the dual shot. Typically, we just see a reflection, whether it's up kick or down kick, that reflection shouldn't be there. So one thing to clarify, looking in the dual shot, a down kick does not mean decrease, does, it does not mean increase. It just means that the wave passed through that particular port. Now, one of the things that I want to walk you through is I want to take you through an example of utilizing the dual shot with the wired equipment. In this example here, you can see the tubing shot, which these are conventional mandrels. And as we talked about with conventional mandrels, there's not much change in cross-sectional area in the ID of the tubing. And so you don't see many, much reflection in the tubing shot. So when we talk about this, we displace the fluid level out of the tubing, and you can see at the end of this acoustic trace, there's a clear upkick. Well, that upkick is significant because that is the end of the tubing. When we displace the fluid out of the tubing, the upkick was ultimately created because we pushed the fluid level out of the tubing, and when the acoustic wave traveled out of the end of the tubing, it was an increase in cross-sectional area, which led to an upkick. In doing this, we were able to use that depth the end of tubing, the de depth, the EOT depth, as our downhole marker in order to calculate the acoustic velocity from the tubing shot. Then we get to the casing shot that was taken prior to the dual shot. And you can clearly see the mandrel reflections from each individual valve that correlate to the TAM wellbore overlay. And you can see that I had utilized gas lift valve number two at a depth of 6791 feet in order to determine the acoustic velocity of this shot. So in both shots, tubing and casing, I now know my acoustic velocity. My acoustic velocity in the tubing shot was 1,233 feet per second, 1,255 feet per second, 
whereas my acoustic velocity in the casing shot was 1177 feet per second. And so in order to get the average, I simply add the two of velocities, divide by two to determine that my average acoustic velocity for the dual shot is 1216 feet per second. Now, with that being said, if you study this acoustic trace, you can see that you really don't see much communication. However, you do see a reflection that correlates to the liquid level that's in the casing annulus. And you also see an upkick that correlates to the end of the tubing. And so in the dual shot, you can actually see both paths, the tubing and the casing. And so here we can see a liquid level in the casing as well as an upkick from the end of the tubing in the dual shot. Now, the next setup that we're gonna talk about is the wireless dual shot setup. And prior to the development of TAM 1.9, which will be released very, very soon, before the end of the year, you actually had to utilize the plunger lift module. Excuse me. You had to utilize the plunger lift module in order to conduct the dual shot. But we've taken the input from the field, we've taken the input from our users, and we've developed a module that's actually built in to facilitate the dual shot. It's going to be an important part of troubleshooting check valves and gas lift systems, as well as holes and tubing of gas wells in the future. And so you can see the basic setup is very similar to what we have in the wired setup. We have a gun mounted on the tubing, and we have a gun mounted on the casing. Now, the difference is, is now that in TAM 1.9, we've built this module in to whereas you can add two sensors. So you have the ability to add in a wireless remote fire gas gun, and in this example, another wireless remote fire gas gun. And whenever you click on to take a shot, both acoustic data streams will be streaming. And so in this particular screenshot, and we'll go through and do a real world example and demonstration, hopefully if we have time, then you can see that the gun that's mounted on the tubing is streaming as well as the gun that's mounted on the casing. And whenever we take the shot, it ultimately generates results in which you can have the acoustic trace from the casing and the tubing. And you can see that these two shots, even though we have the listening trace in pink shifted down, they overlay themselves in the TAM software. So that way you can correlate the listening gun to the firing gun to ultimately find these points of communication in the tubing stream. It's pretty neat, pretty excited about where the dual shot is going. Now, with that being said, you can clearly see that we have one gun in blue on the casing, one gun in pink on the tubing. The gun in blue is the firing gun. The gun in pink is the listening gun. Hence, the firing gun in black, in pink, the listening gun. And you can ultimately see on the listening trace where these valves were open and the acoustic wave from the fire from the, from the casing was able to enter in the tubing and we can correlate that to the depth. Now, one of the things that I wanna take you through is I wanna take you through a real world example that we recently had this year when we were trying to fine tune the dual shot setup in TAM 1.9. This is one that initially puzzled me because as you can see in this dual shot example, the listening trace and the firing trace are the same. And so, we thought, well, we have issues in the software. Well, we thought well, maybe there's a leak in the wellhead because the only way that we're able to pick up the listening trace and it to match the firing trace is if it was very, very, very high in the wellbore. And so we started going, looking, you know, diving deeper in this well. And we knew we had a communication issue because of the gas circulation. We weren't moving any liquid. The plunger was not arriving to surface. However, we were circulating our injection gas. MCF or MCF. So one of the things that we did is that we started looking within the first second. Let's start looking at the beginning of this shot and ultimately determine, is there a point in communication? So we started looking at the individual tubing and casing shots prior to the dual shot. And when you look at the casing shot in blue and the tubing shot in black, you really didn't see much. Sure, in the tubing shot, you see somewhat of a little upkick, but it really didn't correlate to much on the casing shot. 
However, after conducting the dual shot, we can clearly see that at approximately 75 feet, that is when the listening trace picked up the reflection of the acoustic wave that was traveling down the casing. And once we pulled this well, and you can see from the well view report here, found that the second, the bottom of the second joint was parted three quarters of the way around the upper thread section. And you can see the example here. Now the tubing wasn't part parted. I personally would call this a little bit lucky, um, but you see the nice big split here in the pin of this tubing collar, which would correlate to the depth of that we were seeing within the dual shot reflection. Now, with this, a lot of conclusions can be made about the dual shot technique, okay? It's a very reliable tool to determine the presence of holes and other points in communication between the tubing and the casing. So one of the things that you have to understand is you have to understand the wave behaviors in order to properly analyze the acoustic data. So there is a lot of understanding the acoustic analysis in order to troubleshoot utilizing the dual shot method. Conventional single shot records should be used to acquire to determine the accurate acoustic velocity before conducting the dual shot. And then finally, the software features and support from TAM19 in the wireless equipment will aid in identifying, locating, and reporting communication points, and it will improve over time, especially with your input. And so we've got a lot of work to do left on the dual shot, but this is something we want to introduce and show that is a valid method of determining leak, uh, communication points it, prior were not able to be identified well with a single shot echo meter system. Now, with that being said, um, it is 856. Um, what I would like to do is I would like to take a five minute break. And then after our five minute break, we'll come back and quickly within 10 minutes, go through a few examples in TAM of talking about gas lift mandrels and picking down home markers and then get into a little bit of dual shot, and then I will turn it over to Gustavo for plunger lift. So we'll talk to you soon. Let's take a five-minute break. All right, welcome back. What we're going to do is we're going to go through, and I'm going to quickly talk about a couple of examples We're utilizing the downhole marker and identifying direction of kick and identifying different types of gas lift valves, okay? So with that being said, our first example here that we'll actually send out, will be actually sent out, um, is a well that is called multiple kicks gas lift. And in this particular example, we've got two different acoustic traces. The first one, as you can see, is a tubing shot. Sorry, this, it is the first one, but the second shot taken of the day, whereas the first one is the casing shot. Now, there's, this important, there's some important things that I want to point out, and we'll start with the casing shot to analyze. In this particular casing shot, one of the things that stands out clear to me is that originally the default method of analysis, collar count, was selected. And you can clearly see by looking at the red C line that this particular analysis, we only consecutively counted eh, about 20 or 30 percent of the tubing tubing collars. And so we don't have enough tubing collars counted for this to, to calculate the acoustic velocity correctly and ultimately call this a good acoustic shot. It's a good acoustic shot, at least not a good method of calculating the acoustic velocity. But lucky for us, we ultimately have gas lift valves and we can clearly see reflections at mandrel depths. And so with that being said, I know that, hey, I can use those downhole markers as references and ultimately use it to calculate the acoustic velocity. And so one of the things that I'm going to do, first of all, is that I know this is a casing shot and I see it a down kick. And so identifying the casing shot, this could be side pocket or down or, or conventional. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to TAM and I'm going to click on downhole markers method two. And because I've already built in my gas lift valves in the lift system, my gas lift valves are going to be present whenever I click on downhole markers. And you can see your gas lift valves going from top to bottom, starting at 1,958 feet. Now, when I'm picking markers in order to identify for the calculation of acoustic velocity, I'm going to start by clicking on gas lift valve, the top gas lift valve at 1,958 and you'll see the red line. 
Now, this red line is not going to automatically pick the count and the marker for you. You will ultimately need to move this red line to the point at which you pick the marker individually. And so you can get it close in the larger window, and then you can use the zoom window here to fine tune it. And we're going to pick that marker right at the heel, right at the break of the down kick. Once I've selected gas lift marker number one, I'm going to go to marker number two, just across the top of the screen. Once again, I'm going to drag and select the marker. Now, one of the things that I want you to notice as I'm picking these markers, notice the acoustic velocity here in the bottom right hand corner. One of the things that we talked about is that as you go deeper and the temperature and pressure increase, the acoustic velocity will there increase as well. So notice how the acoustic velocity increases as I go deeper. So you can see that we're currently at 1159 feet per second. And we started at, let's go back to number one so we can see. We started at There we go. We started at an acoustic velocity of 1111 feet. And so the acoustic velocity is increasing as we go down the well, as we get deeper. Here we are at 1152. We'll move to gas lift valve number four. 1173. And we'll ultimately work our way down the gas lift valves ultimately reaching the bottom gas lift valve that we can see. And you're starting to see how the gas lift valves are starting to line up with their corresponding valve in, in, the, in the well bore diagram. Acoustic velocity now at 12.03. Twelve oh eight, and it's a good idea to take and go from the top to the bottom on each valve until you get proficient at picking these particular mandrels. And what I'll do is I'm close to that gas lift valve, close to this one, then I'll pick and move over, pick this gas lift valve, pick and move over right at the break. And then finally, this will be the gas lift valve that I'll use as my bottom marker. So we started out at 1111 for feet, footage per second for the acoustic velocity, and we finally ended at 12, uh, 1225, giving me a calculated gas gravity of 0.69. Now, once we've reached the bottom marker, we'll go up and we'll X out, and now the gas lift valve downhole marker method has been complete. Because our liquid level is picked right at the brake, right at the down kick or the heel, which we talked about on Monday, and we can go into fine tune liquid level and see that, and we can adjust it. The resulting acoustic velocity is 1225 feet per second with a distance to liquid of 12,135 feet. Now, so we've completed the, the downhole marker analysis on this particular casing shot. Let's go to the tubing shot. In the tubing shot, once you can see, well, the collar count stopped after the first mandrel. We really didn't get, it's, it's obviously a very, very poor collar count. So we want to use the downhole marker method to determine the acoustic velocity. Now, this is a tubing shot. Let's zoom in to the first mandrel. And what can you notice about the direction of kick? It's an up kick, indicating that these are side pocket mandrels. There's an increase in cross-sectional area in the tubing ID, and you can see throughout this acoustic shot that there are upkicks. And so these make great markers in which to correlate to to utilize the utilize these mandrels as downhole markers. Now, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go through and quickly set these individual mandrels as markers. And then we're going to overlay the two shots and see if they align. So let's quickly go through here. I'm going to move it periodically to align with the break in the up kick from the side pocket mandrel.
making my adjustments periodically. There we go. And then finally, I'm going to end up settling on this gas lift valve here. So we end with a resulting acoustic velocity in the tubing shot of 1,208 feet per second and ultimately a gas gravity of 0.7. I'm going to X out. You can see I use my bottom marker as my gas lift valve and the resulting acoustic velocity of 1,208 feet per second. Now, one of the things that we talked about in the presentation is overlaying the traces. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to annotations, previous shots, and you can see I only have one selection here, and this is the casing shot. If you scroll over, and you can actually expand this entire window, you can see the comment that says shot path casing, as well as the comments that say first casing shot. And so let's do this. Let's overlay that casing shot with the tubing shot by clicking on the casing shot. I'm going to align this by time, and I want to see what they look like. Let's spread them out a little bit. So let's go to the spread function and spread them out just a little bit. And then we'll X out. And you can see here how the mandrel reflections line up in the, in the tubing shot versus the casing shot. And so this is a brief explanation of how you ultimately position the markers in order to utilize the downhole marker to calculate the acoustic velocity and determine the distance to the liquid level. Now, the next example that I want to move into quickly is I want to go and I want to show you an example of a dual shot. The one that I showed you in the presentation was a hole that was up really, really high, 75 feet from surface. Actually ended up being 65. We were 10 feet off. However, in the particular dual shot example that we'll show, You can clearly see in the pink trace, which is the listening trace, how the noise is very quiet on the listening gun. Ultimately, until you have a portion or a valve, check valve, that is leaking and allowing the wave to pass through. Now, some of the features that you can utilize in TAM when analyzing dual shot is the ability to scale up the traces independently. You can also shift them so that way that it's easier to see up or down. You can overlay. Let's go back real quick, and I can put the listening trace on top of the firing trace if I want. It's a nice feature as well. And you can see here, based on the reflections, how I have notations on the acoustic trace which indicate particular valve communication as well as the depth. Now, I went ahead and I plugged in valve four communication, valve six and valve seven, but I wanted to show you how you ultimately add those notes. So all I have to do is right click on the portion of the, of the acoustic trace and add a cross communication reference. Now in this, I can go in here and I can add a custom annotation. So valve number eight, oops, valve number eight, communication, and then I'm going to put in my average acoustic velocity because the acoustic velocity from the tubing shot and the acoustic velocity from the casing shot average to determine the depth. In this particular instance, I'm going to use 1170, and I'm going to add it. And now you can add in this communication point at which you see a spike in the listening trace that should not be there otherwise. Now, you can move these communication points around which will change the resulting depth. And you can edit these communication points by simply just double clicking on the line and making any edits that you need to, to edit on this cross communication plot. Now, one of the things that, you know, we talked about the dual shot and utilizing the wireless equipment or the wired equipment. Um, and previously, we're not able to actually generate a, a PDF report utilizing that information. We've always had to go and take screenshots of the acoustic trace, 
plug it in and analyze it. Well, one of the things that I'm happy to say is that in TAM 1.9, we actually have a report that will generate for the dual shot. So you can simply go to the top and click on report. You see, this is the single one page report that you very, probably very well custom to see. However, now if you go in and you click on dual shot, it will actually add in the dual shot report in which you can see the listening trace, the firing trace, as well as the points of communication that you indicated in the analysis. And so very excited about where this is coming and where this is going. And so with that being said, um, I know we rushed through this very quick. We're happy to answer any questions that you guys have. And with that, I'm going to actually turn it over to Gustavo and let him get into plunger lift. And we're going to log these questions for the question and answer session. Well, let's continue. Thank you for staying here. And remember, your questions may be dropped in the chat. There will be some discussion at the end of the session. Hopefully, we'll be able to answer all of them. We've been receiving some in the private chat and some in the public chat. So uh, next portion of the session will be dedicated to talk about uh, plunger lift. Very common artificial system in many countries. Um, there will be two, basically two uh, sections in here. One to uh, uh, understand how to collect data in a plunger lift well and then some analysis of that data. So let's start with the basic steps to track a plunger. Basically, when we're talking about plunger lift, we need to understand how the cycle goes and how can we optimize cycle production. So uh, talking about plunger lift surveys, we can answer a multitude of questions. And this will be more in line for the analysis section, but let me start with a, a goal in mind. So with a plunger tracking measurement, or when you approach a plunger lift well, you do multiple things. You do single shots, regular shots down the tubing, also down the casing to understand if there is any anomaly, if there is a potential hole in tubing or a tight spot, but also you will be tracking the plunger. And what that means is basically we're not shooting any fluid level, we're just listening on what's going on down the well. We will be uh, connecting a gas gun, the same gun that you use for the flu level shots. And that gas gun will have the uh, ability to listen to the plunger falling and uh, actually listen through the whole cycle. And we will use the plunger falling acoustic signal to determine how fast the plunger falls. As the plunger falls through the tubing colors, there will be a signal reflection from there that we can uh, hear from surface and use that to determine plunger falling velocities. When the plunger hits the liquid, uh, looking at the, the acoustic signal together with the pressure signal, because we'll be simultaneously recording tubing and casing pressure if available. Uh, if you don't have a packer, for example, you can record casing pressure as an additional point of information. And we'll be able to listen to the plunger resting on bottom. So we'll be using the acoustic data and the pressure data to determine uh, where is the cycle at every point in the cycle. We will use that information to interpret the, the data collected in order to understand where is the plunger all the time. Is it at surface? Is it uh, running uh, down the hole through the gas or is it inside the liquid? Is it already at bottom? How long does it take from the plunger being on bottom to open the valve again and start uh, the unloading? Uh, we can understand where is the depth of the liquid in the tubing and also in the casing. You'll be shooting fluid levels in the casing as well as a first uh, portion of the test, remember. Um, we can understand about producing bottle hole pressure, static pressure. Um, where are the casing and tubing pressures during the cycle? So how they fluctuate and, and putting that information together help us to understand multiple things. I have a few examples at the end where we use the tubing and casing pressure information to understand some problems in the well. Um, <clears throat> we can understand if that uh, gas pressure buildup is being, uh, is being pushing the liquid out of the hole or out of the tubing. Um, understand what is the gas flow rate, what's coming from the formation, what's coming from, uh, what's going up the annulus or the flow line. We have techniques to understand gas gravity if that's a need. But also we can understand uh, using this information to see if we have any restriction of the pump. So if you have anything going on down the tubing that prevents the tubing getting 
all the way down to the bottom. So let's start with the procedure first. This slide shows a wireless equipment. So we have a wireless base with a computer that's talking to a gas gun that's connected to the tube. And this is the recommended way to install the gun and elbow vertical. So avoiding the liquid coming to surface to enter the gas gun. We usually charge the gas gun with some nitrogen exceeding the expected peak uh, tubing pressure. So with that, we also are, have the ability, sorry, to collect casing pressure. So by the, to collect the casing pressure, you can use either another gas gun if you have it. You may be using two guns to perform uh, dual shots as Justin just explained, or you can use just a regular uh, pressure transducer. This is an additional pressure transducer we sell um, that can be connected to the casing. So with the gas gun, we'll be collecting acoustic and pressure data, uh, acoustic and pressure data. We have a microphone and a built-in pressure transducer. And on the casing side, by using an additional gun or a pressure transducer, we can collect casing pressure. So those basically will be the three signals we'll be plotting during a plunger tracking test. You can also use wired equipment. If you have a compact gas gun, you can connect it again, vertical, elbow, uh, charging the nitrogen, uh, the chamber with some nitrogen pressure above the expected peak tubing head pressure. Uh, or you can use a, a conventional remote fire gas gun. <laughs> To the casing, uh, you can connect the pressure transducer here. The, let me just zoom in at the casing pressure transducer connection. So then there will be a Y cable that connects both pressure transducer from tubing pressure and casing pressure all together coming to the well analyzer. And of course, the microphone cable coming from the tubing um, gas gun. So that's the basic uh, setup, nothing. Uh, extraordinary. So we do a conventional installation to shoot fluid levels down the tubing, down the casing, and then uh, track the plunger. If you have only one gun and a pressure transducer, recommendation is to get the well, shoot the casing first, then move the gun to the tubing. So you can do the single shot in the tubing and then start the plunger recording, the plunger tracking test itself. To start to do so, of course, uh, let's go quickly through the steps in the software. We have to start the software, go to pick wells, just pick your well uh, where you're going to uh, collect data if you, the well doesn't exist, of course. You should uh, be better prepared, you create a well at the office, um, get, make sure all the equipment works before you go out to the field and drive for a couple of hours to get to a well. But you pick the well and uh, uh, you're about to analyze Go to the plunger lift module. This is a special test. And let's do a setup for a plunger tracking test. So before we start the acquisition, we can click on start acquisition or before that, before that we can do a preview of the data. So this is the test. We have to set up the equipment as well. So first we make sure that we have selected the, the tubing gas gun and that's the correct gas gun. If you have two guns, make sure that you have the right uh, selection for the tubing and casing. You may have a gas gun or a pressure transducer here. So once the equipment is selected, it is uh, normal that you perform a zero offset. So you go the normal procedure to do zero offset, get the new offset, push again that button. Just do remember that we have pressure transducers in each gas gun. Um, so we have to normally do a zero offset to the tubing pressure transducer and the casing pressure transducer. Once you have the equipment set up, next step would be previewing. Let's make sure before you start recording that every all the data is being transmitted properly. So you can you have some previews buttons here. I'm going to show that again. So you have some previews buttons there, and what the software does it will it'll show you uh, that data. So you can you can click on preview and then make sure that you have the acoustic signal coming. You have the pressure. The tubing pressure being read properly. If you have another gun, you may have a, a casing acoustic signal. You won't really use that much uh, unless you have problems in the well. And then the casing pressure. So all the data is, is being transmitted properly. This is the point when, depending on the type of plunger you're running, you may need to change the sampling rate. Sampling rate may be 30 for wired equipment, 60 for wireless equipment. So normally that would be a 30 hertz for conventional plungers, dual part plungers. Uh, solid bar plungers, 30 hertz is, uh, is a good sampling speed. Those plungers don't run very fast, but as long as you're running faster plungers, let's say bypass plungers, um, uh, 
uh, even even faster plunges like ball and leaf, then you will require to increase the sampling speed. And I will have some examples to show why we need uh, to increase the sampling speed. It is important to go faster so we can catch the moment when the plunger passes through the color recess. Really fast plungers, 30 hertz is normally not enough. So we give you the opportunity to change the sampling rate before starting the data acquisition. Once everything's ready, the equipment setup is okay. The sampling rate is according to the plunger uh, speed you're running in the well. You can start recording by clicking start acquisition. You will have the ability to show what's being recorded. In each of the channel, you have these uh, corner buttons here that you can click on and expand the view. In this case, we have an expanded acoustic um, tubing signal. With this, we have on top, we have all the data recorded to that point since the beginning of the test till uh, the time you click on that expansion button. On the left-hand side, you will have a, the previous minute of the data being recorded. And what you can see here, those kicks are actually color kicks, as you can see that up there. Well, and this is the real time. So this will be in progress. It will be ongoing, filling up as you are recording data. So you can, you can see real time data and look at how uh, the plunger is passing through colors. Actually, you can count how many colors per minute and you would have a good idea how fast the plunger is falling in real time. You can do that with any of the data, including tubing, pressure. Um, you can expand the view and depending on screen size you have, you may actually expand a couple of them simultaneously. So using that data, uh, give you again, at the field, a, a quick, fast sense of how the plungers, uh, how fast the plunger is falling, falling along the cycle. And, and the plunger falling velocity usually fluctuates along the cycle varies based on multiple things, how fast the tubing pressure increases, the deviation of the well, the type of plunger you have. If you have any com uh, condition in the well, like a, a sticky condition due to chemical injection, any tight spot, holes in tubing, there will, there will be things that fluctuates, uh, makes, that, ma makes the plunger, plunger falling speed to change along the cycle, and you wanna see how that varies. Another thing uh, you can plot is the tubing pressure. And at this point, when you, you catch a moment, so you're looking at here all the cycle. And at this point, real time, you see how the pressure just dropped. So one thing you can do is you can go to and click on annotate. And there'll be an annotations button there where you can click on it. And that'll give you the ability to input a comment in the software to mark this point in time as a, as a valve opening point. So you, you will see how the software gives you the ability by clicking on annotate, it will open an annotations option window, which will allow you to enter annotations. And annotations are predetermined or you can do a customized one, there's a custom annotation. And so by clicking on uh, an add button, will input an, an additional annotation you can um, navigate this plot either by using this bar and bottom or you have a magnifying glass. So with the magnifying glass, you can zoom in to that area, for example, here to the uh, drop of pressure and pick the point with very good accuracy and tell the software, hey, this point right here is when the valve open, where you can see the pressure dropping. And you can, you can include many annotations when the, when the valve open here, the fluid got to surface, uh, plunger got to surface, the valve closed. So th all those are annotations uh, that you can do in the software. So when it comes to analyze the data, you don't have to spend time picking that because you're just looking at the data at the well, giving you enough opportunity to do that. So while you're recording, uh, you, you monitor the cycle, you have to wait at least for a complete cycle that like we just had here from valve opening point, closing, valve opening point. So valve open to valve open, that's one cycle. You may wait some long, uh, some more time to see the valve closing again. So you have from valve close to valve close, that would be another cycle. Um, so when you're ready to stop the test, basically let's, um, let's use some of the information uh, to add or annotations, adding annotations using the scroll bar or again, the magnifying glass. You're done with the test, it finished. You're, you're good enough with the data have been collected so far. You can click on stop test and the software will ask you just a, a double 
uh, check and you really want to stop the test. We don't want to just accidentally stop the test. Click on yes, stop the test, and that will show on the field view all the data that has been recorded so far. Obviously, this is a very long test. You can see in the field view the duration of the test. So this test started uh, and went overnight. So it started at 8 p.m., started at 9 p.m. next day. So it was uh, around uh, 20 hours the duration test. Uh, sampling speed was 30 hertz. You can see here uh, all the cycles that has been recorded. Obviously, for this, you may need an additional hardware at the well. Now, the computer storage capacity is uh, normally big enough. If you're not sampling too fast, um, you'll be able to, to sample uh, many cycles if you need to. Normally, this just maybe one or a couple of cycles that are being recorded, but this uh, company wanted to do a spatial analysis in this well and, and see how the cycle behaves along the day. Things you can do out in the field if you're going to uh, run the test for a long time, you can you can plug uh, the well to a battery. We give you a charger, so if you have AC at the well, you can connect a charger. If you have that electrical connection, now we have a waterproof connection, but um, what we do normally is if we're going to leave equipment out in the field, we put uh, some additional protection. Uh, the equipment itself is built with a IP protection that it should stand for you know, light rain or some rain, but if it's gonna be out there, we just go ahead and cover it. So it doesn't, it doesn't hurt to protect it some more. Um, for long, longer term tests, so let's say you have a, a test for a day or more, you may wanna use a deep cycle battery. That, that'll give you many more hours and actually days of data collection where you can keep the battery of the laptop running all the time so it doesn't run out of power because the sensors will have uh, as you say at least you know, 12 hours of data collection or some and we're coming with another generation of equipment uh, in the near future where we have more powerful batteries and radios so that'll that time will even increase in the future but so far if you're planning to do a long-term test we recommend you to go ahead and and get you yourself something to power the uh, equipment. So with that, uh, that's basically uh, how you set up the equipment out in the field and you'll be ready to analyze the data once you collect that. So next section would be understanding how we analyze and troubleshoot a plunger lift well using a commuter data, um, give you a good level of detail of what's going on in the well. It eliminates the guesswork because at, at any point, you know where the plunger is at. You know if the plunger is at surface, you know if the plunger is falling through the gas or is running down the liquid or if it hits a bottom, or if it's stuck somewhere, just so you will, you will tell where the plunger is during the cycle and you can optimize your cycle. You can optimize your sales time, your downtime or shutting time based on what you observe in a, a plunger tracking test. So first thing to do when you get to a plunger lift well is understand if there is any potential problem in the well. Um, and one of the options you have is shooting fluid levels down the tubing and the casing. And, and casing shots are especially important when you don't have a, a, a casing uh, packer. Uh, you, you're expecting to see a liquid level very close to the end of tubing. If that's not the case, you're very likely facing uh, a hole in tubing, but you can find things like this. So for example, this well here, has a, a tubing shot, and you can see on the tubing shot, you see a tight spot that is uh, uh, around 4,800 feet from surface. So you see a down kick before the end of tubing. So this well has a fluid level that is actually below the end of tubing, but you can see that tight spot there. The well has been shot in long enough and shoot a fluid level, see a down kick, see an up kick, so you have a good downhole marker that you can use to determine distance to the hole, or in this case, to the tie spot. And you know, if you would be running a plunger this well, very likely the plunger will now pass this point. And that may be the reason why you've been getting um, a dry plunger or decrease in production because the software have to lift the fluid above the point so the plunger can lift anything above it. 
Another thing, uh, this is a different well, having a, a two in shot again, you see an app kick. So app kick, if you remember the first session, app kicks comes from enlargement. Usually if you're doing that, a two in shot, it's not the end of tubing, then that's likely a hole in tubing. So you can, you can find problems or expect what to see on the acoustic uh, trace while you're recording the plunger tracking by shooting initial fluid level shots. So thus individual shots, regular single shot as we call them. You can find problems again, like a tight spot or a hole in tubing in your well. Benefits of running a plunger, again, it eliminates the guesswork. You know where the plunger is all the time. Um, it helps you to optimize how you run the, cy the cycle. Uh, you know if the plunger is resting on the city nipple or down there in the bumper spring. Uh, is it uh, resting there for too long? Uh, are you having too long of shutting time? So you can reduce that so you can have more cycles a day, increasing production. So you'll be you'll be decreasing the shutting time to increase production. Uh, you can check the if your after flow can be uh, adjusted or optimized. And in general, it saves time to the users. All plungers are run to make and maximize sales time. So you can you can uh, use the information to adjust your cycle, how much time you have opening and closing that valve, and see how much you can improve production uh, by adjusting the cycle. So let's start with a conventional operational cycle in a plunger lift well. And by using the data here, we can uh, look at the tubing pressure is usually a good indicator to see where we are in the cycle. This is a well with no packer and we can see the pressure drop. So let's start, and we could start at any point. Let's start when the valve opens. So for us in this cycle, we start the cycle when the valve opens. So that's what we call the unloading. The motor valve on surface opens, the pressure drops, Plunger is on bottom at that point, hopefully, and takes off, comes back to surface with some liquid above. Then what you see next is the liquid arrives to surface and the plunger arrives. After the plunger arrives, that's what we call the afterflow. And that's a period of time that after the plunger arrives, the valve remains open until the valve closes. And that's what we call the shutting time. So we monitor once the valve closes, the plunger falls, and we monitor using the acoustic data, the plunger falling velocity until the plunger hits the liquid. We can listen to when the plunger hits the liquid and we can see based on acoustic data and pressure data when the plunger is resting on bottom. And we, we uh, analyze some of the data to review some of that. So plunger resting on bottom, that's a complete cycle. Then after that, you have the valve opening again and a new cycle begins. So this, this goes over and over. And this is basically how a normal plunger cycle works. Obviously that this doesn't apply in faster plunger like gas assisted plunger lift wells where the shutting time is minimum and sometimes just a few seconds. So you have more a continuous run uh, well that those plungers uh, have a much higher velocities and we will have to make some adjustment in the software like increasing the uh, sampling speed to be able to record useful data in those type of wells. Once you finish the recording you have something like this so, so this will be your field view before you start analyzing or setting up the cycles. In this well we have again the black line is a acoustic data, casing pressure and tubing pressure and these colors are customizable. You can click on that gear and, and change the color if you want. Uh, I normally don't do it. I, I think that contrast in this color is good enough. And here's when we go out to the uh, cycles and we select a cycle. So we tell the software what are the cycle uh, uh, boundaries and we define where is my cycle. So let's start with that. And we, once you click on uh, cycles, you go from the field view to a view where you can start doing a sequence of steps to analyze the data. So data has been recorded, you get the data, now let's analyze it. First is defining the cycle, and you may record multiple cycles, so you, you analyze a cycle at a time. So you go from valve opening to valve opening, or from valve close to valve close. Then you uh, uh, 
set the cycle limit. So what happened between the valve opening and valve opening, basically, and then understand how the plunger falls. So uh, calculate the plunger fall velocity. So it will be a step-by-step -step process. You may use a, a, a window here that is to understand gas properties if you, if you need to, or you can go to analyze the data and do analysis plot. So we'll go through some of these steps uh, during the presentation. <laughs> Define the cycle, and again, you will click on will click on any of these uh, buttons, and they will take you to these steps here. So this will be the first portion of the analysis. You have to tell the software, hey, uh, this is when the valve close, and then you, your cycle is starting with either the valve opening or the valve closing. So you tell the software, what are you picking as the cycle begin? And I will, uh, if I have time, I will try to run an example real quick. So in this case, once you start recording, the first thing happening is the valve closing. You pick that, you, so you tell the software, click on A and move the pointer here. So if you wanna do a more accurate selection, you have a magnifying glass that you can use to zoom in at this point. So let's say this example here, use the magnifying glass to uh, zoom in at this point. Once you do that, that's what you see. You have a much better view of the pressure fluctuation. You see pressure. Valve closes there, pressure builds up a little bit until the pressure equalizes and the plunger drops. So the plunger falls here and you start seeing those color echoes. As the plunger falls, you see color echoes, but we're not there yet. You, we're just setting the cycle. Um, before you do that, we, we can see that's a common uh, change in pressure when the, when the plunger falls, so we can accurately determine the plunger fall in time uh, by picking the, the, the start of the plunger of fall. With that, you can do the same and the software just defining the cycle. Once you tell the software, yeah, my cycle goes from A to C, which means the valve opening, valve closing, valve opening again. Now it's time to tell the software all the things. What happened within the cycle? So when the plunger gets to surface, when the liquid arrives, um, when the plunger uh, arrives or when the plunger hits the liquid, when the plunger is on bottom. So those uh, portion of the, of the cycle are being uh, told to the software. So by looking at the history data, after the plunger, after the plunger start falling, we saw, we saw that and we set that to the software by clicking on the pressure build up. We listen to the plunger falling and we'll have a better analysis of that. By zooming in the data, you will see the plunger just hitting the liquid. The plunger hits the liquid, and then we'll see, analyze the data to see when the plunger is resting on bottom. And all this is just a kind of lost time of the plunger on bottom until the valve opens again. So we can tell the software when that happened. Also, during the unloading, we can tell when the liquid arrived, look at the acoustic signal, how it changed dramatically. Also, the tubing pressure spikes start going up and when the plunger arrives, that's another big noise there. And that's the, usually the maximum tubing pressure point. So we can tell the software when the plunger hits the liquid and how many jobs will happen between. When the plunger is on bottom, when the liquid arrives and plunger arrives. That's the cycle limits uh, being told there. Then once you have that done, the, the software allows you to focus on the plunger falling section of the cycle and then you go and click on uh, cycle limits, but we'll go there in a second. This is another example of zooming on that. Just let's zoom in this area and we'll see how you can listen to the colors and how the big splash and acoustic signal change. You don't see colors anymore and the signal gets quiet and a little pressure jump and drop in the tubing case inside. Zooming in, now you can tell with more accuracy by using a magnifying glass. You, you zoom in, in the software, like I can say in this, so in this section here, and you can tell the software when the plunger hits a liquid and you sometimes, sometimes you can listen, even the plunger falling in the liquid, you can see how the colors are reflected and then it gets quieter, it gets quieter and the pressure jumps a little bit. So that's the point when the plunger is on bottom. So we, we can uh, physically, determine when that is happening. Then in the unloading uh, section, we can tell the same. We can use the magnifying glass, zoom in and tell this is the plunger, uh, sorry, the liquid arriving and that's the plunger arriving. So we can have enough level of detail to tell 
that to the software. <clears throat> you can manually enter those uh, points as we saw before, or you can use the annotations that you used before. When you were analyzing the data out in the field or collecting the data in the field, you were making annotations. So something you can do is you can click on A and tell the software, hey, I know when the valve closed and I'm going to pick that from my annotations. So you go to click on, annot click on annotations, you have a drop down list of all the annotations and just click on the valve closing and apply to the marker. So the software will automatically put that in the line because you already did that job out of the field. So that expedites uh, or optimize your time in the office when analyzing the data. <clears throat> this uh, video here shows um, quickly how cycle limits are selected. So, uh, well, so go to the plug your cycle. Now let's let's do the last portion. This is probably one of the things that people pay more attention to. So I want to know how fast my plunger is falling because you have an expected plunger velocity from the manufacturer, but now you will be able to see how fast the plunger is actually falling. You'll be able to determine or tell the software this is a call and that's another call and the plunger goes falling down. So this video shows how to tell the software or how to add those color echoes in the software so we can determine velocity falling down. How do we know velocity? Well, because we know the distance between joints. You have already input part of the uh, well file creation, uh, the average joint length. So one thing that the software does is, let me go back a little bit, as you're adding colors, let me go back here, we'll be adding and adding colors and you can do that all the way down or you can t use the auto selected section or, or option of the software to automatically generate those additional color selection. And this well had colors going down to 227 joints. So the liquid was found after 227 joints when the plunger was falling down. And this window here is what shows the plunger falling velocity. So you can see and, and pay attention to the units that we use for that. So we use negative values for feet per minute because the plunger is moving down. So that's what we tell the plunger is falling. And the faster it falls, you see that scale here is uh, faster on bottom. So the plunger is actually slowing down and that's pretty common as the tubing pressure increases. And you can have another uh, line here that shows the plunger uh, depth. So you, you see how the plunger is falling and how the velocity is decreasing in the well. That's the result of the plunger uh, velocity plot. <clears throat> so you have that when you're analyzing the data and you can export this plot and, and see on which portions of the well this is happening. So once you have that again, you can just come up and pull the software and it will give you or generate that plunger falling velocity plot. Oops. Sorry for that. No time for the software yet. Okay, that's where we were. <clears throat> so you can use adding um, colors. If you see an outlier on the plot, you can click on that line or that point and the software in the background will, will take you there. So if you need to make any arrangement after you do an automatic color selection, the software uh, do a pretty good job selecting the colors, but they, you may want to correct a color selection that may be allowed, an outlier. Once you have that again, the lower the plot looks, the faster the plunger is falling. You can always invert that plot if you don't feel comfortable with that. We're used to see it this way. So we're, we know this plunger is slowing down from 100, 230 uh, feet per minute to close to 130 feet per minute. Uh, by, by the time it hits the liquid in the tubing. Another window you can use if you want to calculate the gas gravity is using the acoustic velocity there. But um, I, will, I will skip that part. We can use just the reflections of that sound wave traveling up and down hitting the top of the plunger. And as we know, the plunger distance, time and distance is, is simple to calculate acoustic velocity. 
Acoustic velocity and pressure allows the software to calculate a gas gravity. So gas gravity value can be determined by, by uh, selecting some additional echoes between the color echoes. This uh, section here will show a quick example. Go to plunge your lift. That's a cycle selection and you can go to analysis. So once you've done the selection of the cycle and the limits and analyze the plunger falling velocity, what you can do is you can see how the plunger falls and how the variables change in the well. And you have gas flow, tubing pressure, how the liquid accumulates and how the plunger falls. So you can play that at different times. So it will be, in uh, this case, a seven second interval. You can move that with your mouse pointer or you can just play and reproduce like a cycle in every seven second steps. In this case, you can change the steps depending on the plunger falling velocity. And you can see there how the plunger is falling. Where is the plunger at that point in time? What is the tubing and pressure? Where's the casing pressure and then things like that. So uh, you can see the plunger now hits the liquid and the velocity stabilizes until the plunger is on bottom. So it's not moving anymore. Plunger falling velocity zero and then Valve opens and takes off. So it has an average upward velocity of close to uh, 680 feet per minute. Plunger is on surface and now it's just a uh, sales time after flow. How you want, you want to sell? Um, this is a, a way to see the data that you have in the software. Another way is using the analysis plot. So for me, this is very useful. We can uh, plot different variables. Here, and something you can do is you go there, you select the cycle you want to view, because again, you can record multiple cycles and you can look at portions of different cycles or, or different cycles of that measurement. So we, we can plot things on how tubing and casing pressure fluctuate along the cycle, or for example, plunger falling velocity, that's a green line here, and the plunger position or plunger depth. Where is the plunger at those points? Are the plunger falling? Plunger here in the liquid, you see how the velocity slows down. And again, this is a the negative goes, it's going down. Positive, the plunger is coming up. <clears throat> that video here shows about when you run that analysis plot. And again, the intervals may change and you see how the plunger is now falling and the plunger, average plunger falling velocity. This one is about 220 uh, feet per minute. Then plunger at that point hits a liquid, slows down to 35, from 200 to 35 feet per minute, and then plunger is on bottom. So those are things you can easily observe by um, analyzing the data and going to the analysis plot. You can do that with multiple cycles. You So the first cycle, now you're looking at a different uh, cycle here or a different section of the cycle here based on your selection when the valve uh, flows and the plunger falls. So that's uh, basically a, a cool way to observe what's going on in your cycle and see how much time you have from, from, a, from one point to the other and see how much you can uh, optimize your cycle. So basically troubleshooting uh, plunger wells is, uh, is another thing you can do. So you can, what we observed today is in those videos is just a normal well, not uh, indications of a big problem with room for optimization. Um, but you outside that normal well, you have the ability to uh, troubleshoot a well. So let's say you have a decrease in production or a loss in production, you wanna understand what's going on in the well. So one thing you can do is uh, find holes in tubing in, in a gas well or a plunger lift well. And Justin talked about a different technique and much more accurate technique that is a dual shot. But looking at plunger data, we can also determine when we have a hole in tubing. Then we can do a dual shot to confirm the depth. But there will be some really cool data that I want to show some slides of it where you can tell uh, having a problem. Uh, using key points and the software that you can observe, like pressure drop when the plunger falls, um, you see pressure increases that is when the pressure starts going up, that's normally an indication of holes in tubing, things like that. So uh, listening the acoustic data, when the, you listen in colors, 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 and then goes mute, goes silent, then, uh, so it means the plunger stopped. The plunger is not showing any color reflections anymore. So let's see some of the uh, analysis data 
here. This well on, on top is an example on a well, on a well with a, a hole in tubing. So you can look at the acoustic data. You see color echoes, color echoes, and you continue seeing color echoes, but what happened with the tubing pressure? Look at the tubing pressure dropped and we see colors. And then after some point, the tubing pressure just take off. You see the pressure going up from here to that point. Or this helps a little bit. So you have a linear tubing pressure behavior and then boom, goes up. Why is the pressure going up? Because after the plunger passes the hole, now the casing pressure, which is higher, enters the tubing and we can see an increase in the tubing pressure because the gas gun pressure transducer is connected to surface. So after again, after the plunger passes the hole, the casing pressure enters the tubing, observing now an increase in the tubing head pressure coming from the tubing annulus, of the casing annulus. Another example here, you see tubing pressure dropping when the plunger falls and that's normal. And you see colors, you see colors and, and the regular pressure steady increase. And after some point it's completely quiet. So why are we not seeing colors? But also tubing pressure went up again. That means the tubing uh, is holding now the plunger weight. The, pl the tubing uh, was holding the, the uh, that up in the catcher was uh, the plunger weight. Then the plunger falls. Now the tubing pressure is holding the plunger weight. And at this point, the plunger is resting on the tubing again. So there is a tight spot in this well that is, that is uh, the plunger is getting stuck at that point and there is no more plunger travel after this. This uh, hole here was uh, actually, we received a picture of it. And this is the, hole in tubing that was uh, reflecting that uh, uh, 5,000, that's a regular hole in tubing that can be easily catched by the software reading. Another well, you can see tubing casing pressure, you can listen to plunger falling, plunger falling, and then we don't listen anymore. Well, that's the end of the tubing, but I'll, actually you can see also tubing head pressure get together. What that means? Well, if, if you are familiar with the gas well, plunger lift well, you see the difference between tubing and casing pressure is the amount of liquid in the tubing. And we started with more pressure difference and we ended up with those pressures going together. And that means all the liquid was pushed out of the tubing, an indication that this well needs a standing valve to keep the liquid in the fluid, uh, the liquid in the tubing. Um, have a few more slides with some examples. So let me keep going here. Uh, another well, you can see some acoustic data, then flat. Flat pressure increase, normally indication the plunger is getting stuck in the tubing. And there was actually a, a gas gun shot and we send the blast pressure down the tubing and that make the plunger continue falling again. So maybe a tight spot there, not very hard. The plunger was able to go through. Another example of that, you see how the color echoes are here, color echoes on pressure fluctuation, and then completely quiet. Tubing pressure is not changing, but the acoustic is totally quiet, indication the plunger got stuck and then send the pressure, a pulse again, and the plunger keeps falling after blasting the, the, the well. Another thing we can uh, track here is uh, how a chemical treatment may affect the plunger falling velocity. It may get a, a sticky tubing and you can see the plunger the tar falling at a fast speed or expected speed of close to 350 feet per minute quickly slows down to less than 100 feet per minute. Some, at some point it takes off, go fast again and slow down. So in average, this uh, plunger is falling below, below 100 feet per minute and probably the expectation is the plunger falls like falls like three times faster. If you're not looking at how the plunger is falling, you're expecting after some time the plunger be on bottom, but no, it's going slow and you open the valve and the plunger is still not on bottom. So you get much less production or even a dry plunger, which is even worse at surface. So you can optimize how you're doing, uh, how you're producing your well by looking at the data and knowing where is your plunger at when you open the valve. 
Another thing really cool to see is we can we can uh, plot, this is part of the analysis plot, we can plot the tubing pressure, how the tubing pressure fluctuates, look at the tubing pressure changing, kind of, kind of in a ladder, so it goes up, stabilize, goes up and stabilize, goes up and stabilize. Why is that happening? Well, very likely you have a standing valve in this well. So standing valve is open and then it closes. When it closes, stabilize. How that affects the plunger velocity based on the gas flow? Well, you see the plunger velocity is steady and faster when the valve is closed and the plunger velocity slows down because it goes up in our uh, plot and it slows down and then fastens again when it's flatter. So standing valve open slows down the plunger velocity and, and it fluctuates along the cycle. I'll go for a couple more minutes and then I'll come with uh, some more examples uh, after the break. <laughs> um, here, another well, you see tubing pressure, valve closes, the shutting time begins, you see the pressure increase, then the plunger drops. And this, this took a little longer than normal but we see there is no noise when the when the valve closed until some pressure was accumulated, and then finally the plunger fold. Plunger fold here, and it took some time. Then you see all tubing colors, tubing colors, and then a pressure increase, quick pressure increase, and the acoustic get quieter. And again, an indication of a tight spot because the pressure drop here, we're gaining that pressure again. Plunger weight resting on the tubing indication of a tight spot. Very likely if you do a tubing shot, you will be able to catch this. But with this information, you can determine at which joint you have that uh, tight spot because you can count the colors all the way down to, to the tight spot. Another thing we can do, and uh, this is um, a couple of last, last slides, is uh, tracking faster plungers. So we'll be, we'll be looking at some slides of a uh, conventional plunger, but this it's a bypass well, so a well with bypass plunger. So you see, uh, after you analyze the data, you can come up with a plunger falling velocity plot. And this plunger here is falling at around, what, 950 feet per minute uh, in average. And after some colors, the velocity starts to slow down and it goes to less than 400 feet per minute. So it behaves differently going towards more a solid bath, uh, plunger. Where a solid plunger, why, why is it a solid plunger if it's supposed to be a bypass? Well, at this point, there is no more bypass. The bypass closes. This is a defective plunger. So you're expecting the plunger falls to over 900 feet per minute, but it's actually falling up to less than half the speed. This will result in much longer time needed if you want to wait till the plunger is up with some bottom and below the liquid. So this well, uh, the, the person was thinking that the bypass plungers don't work in my well, but actually that's just a defective bypass plunger that needs to be replaced. So you now are not just guessing because you're getting a dry plunger on surface because you're opening the valve too soon or just lower production. You, are, you have the proof that what the problem is in the well. Another thing we can track is a balance lift plunger, bypass plunger that, that goes to a, a really high speed. So like this plunger here falls at around 5,000 feet per minute and some plungers falls really, really fast. We can track that. We, we, sometimes we can because of the amount of fluid and it will depend on how much liquid the well produces. But as long as we can hear uh, the plunger, uh, the plunger falling through the color recesses, through the tubing recesses, then we can uh, determine the plunger falling velocity. Gapple wells, so sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. Um, but this example here was a successful test in a, in a really fast falling plunger where the velocity goes at around 5,000 feet per minute. And after some point, it slows down to close to 1,000 feet per minute. So yeah, we still have a high average acoustic velocity, but what happened here? Is that just because of the inclination of the well changed? Is there any, anything going on down the well that could cause the plunger slowing down that much? It was falling at close to three, what? 36, 3,500 feet per minute and slows down dramatically. So uh, good pieces of information to understand your wells. 
and how to optimize them. What's really important in these type of wells is you change the sampling speed. So the, on the left-hand side, we have a portion of the cycle when the tubing pressure, we can, we can see the green line, the valve closes. And after a minute or so, actually less just a few seconds, the valve opens. That's enough for the plunger to fall. And we can listen to the plunger falling if we increase the acoustic uh, uh, sampling speed. This is the result of that data by looking at the plunger falling. We can really see good colors, but when we increase the sampling speed from 30 hertz to 480 hertz, now we have clear color echoes observed that we can use to determine the plunger falling velocity. So this is just 0.1 minute. So we have a good number of colors in a tenth of a minute. So we can we can use that information to calculate how fast the plunger falls. Well, let's uh, start looking at some examples. And what I'll do uh, is I will I will just open for the sake of the time that we have left. We still need to talk about gas well. So I'll go ahead and open. Uh, just a plunger cycle, and, and we have some wells here, like a, a fast bypass well. This, this well is falling at a fairly fast speed. We can see here how, how good the colors are observed. And let me make this window just a 0.4 seconds or so. We see here good color echoes, and we can see good color echoes pretty much all the way down. Um, well, it's going to be, this is just easy to see uh, the selection of the sulfur, but what most people would be focused on is learning how fast the plunger was falling. And we see here fairly stable plunger falling velocity between 22 and 1800 feet per minute. Let's say averaging what, 2000 feet or so? That'll be about the average falling speed. Let's say 2016 feet per minute is the average falling speed for this well. Um, how do I analyze a cycle? Let me go and, and pull a, a cycle real quick. And this is the data after being collected. That's how you, when you open the file, that's what you see from the field view. We have tube casing pressure, tubing pressure, acoustic. If you're going to go by analyzing this well, let's go to cycles. And I, what I'll do is I'm going to delete the cycle. And I'm going to make the cycle again. So the cycle we have done first is from the valve cl closing point to the valve closing point. But we can do something different. We can do valve opening to valve opening. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's add a cycle. And we first have to de define the cycle, where, where my cycle goes from where to where. So first thing is we can click on it. We can do a zoom in to do a better selection of that section. So we can be picky and say, hey, it's right here. And I'm starting with the valve opening. That's important. That's the first thing you do. I'm starting with the valve opening. That's the valve opening point. Zoom out all the way. And then the next step is the valve closes. Where the valve closes? Well, right here. Let's go click on B. Valve closes here. We can move it with the mouse pointer or just click on it at that point. You can again zoom in. And yeah, that was a pretty good selection. So you can just go ahead and click on it. That's the valve closing. You can see, you can see how, uh, let's go on a little bit uh, valve close there, sorry. Valve closes and then last thing is valve opening. So C, you can click on C and go to valve opening. Zoom in again and valve opens right here. You can, let me move away. You can hear the noise, you can see the pressure drop. So it's fairly simple to select that. So that's it. So we have a valve opening, valve closing, valve opening. That's done. Let's go to the next step, which is uh, assigning the cycle limits. So when the valve opens, plunger comes to the surface, then the liquid arrives. The liquid arrives right here. So first thing happening is liquid arriving. You can move it there. Again, you can always, I like to do that, zoom in. I have a better selection around here. Then valve, the plunger arrives when you arrive and usually that's the biggest noise and pressure spike very close to that point. So let's look at that. Yeah, good selection. And looking at the acoustic trace, we can see the plunger falling down. 
the liquid hits the surface. So after the valve closes, plunger falls. <clears throat> but we have to see at what point the liquid uh, is it the, the, the plunger hits a liquid. So let me go there, remove this. I'm looking at plunger hits a liquid. I'm going to zoom in on the acoustic data. Uh, we can see colors. You can always turn off the pressure if that's a problem. So you can see better how the colors were coming. Those colors, colors, colors. And then here from this point on, we can't see any colors. That means the plunger hits the liquid. And then we will have a quiet period and that right here. Oh, sorry. Didn't mean to do that. Plunger is on bottom is right there. So you can see how quiet it gets when the plunger is uh, resting on bottom. So that would be the cycle limit. And the next step would be go to the plunger fall. So you can click from here, or if you exit that you still have the same options here. So plunger falling velocity, we can look at. So the software, what the software is doing is from the cycle, from the valve closing, to the valve open, it will show you so from the valve closing to the plunger hits a liquid. It will show you that section and a zoom in here, which is all this section here, where you have to select those color cakes. So first thing is to start start with the plunger falls. We can we can show the pressure. That usually helps. Again, show the pressure. So plunger falls here, we see the pressure increase, boom, pressure drop. So valve closes, pressure increase, pressure drop, that's the plunger falling point. So the first point is right there. I'm going to add colors. When I'm doing that, the software is creating a table, say that's my color zero, that's just falling. And I'm going to add the color. And this here will be my first color kick. I'm going to add the color and the software will automatically recommend me the next color kick that he thinks is the color. So that's a software recommendation. And you have that. I may want to do a small correction here, but that's good. That's good. So the call, the software is recommending that. You can put this at different time. Uh, I like to see better what I'm doing. So probably this well, that's not bad. It's probably for just to show you the software selections are good. And the software is doing a good job selecting the color. So when I feel comfortable with the software picking the colors, we can keep doing this all the way down. And I'm just clicking on add colors, or you can use the auto select option. Uh, to this point, you can see how the plunger falling velocity is changing, it's slowing down from 780 or so, and it's less than 500 feet per sec, feet per minute already. You can keep adding colors. And those are, as you can see, those are very clear color kicks very good color kick. So I'm going to click on auto select. The software did the selection for me. Even the very last colors when the plunger was getting to bottom. Uh, I'm going to span that and we see how the plunger velocity results. Okay. Um, that's uh, one thing you can after that go to the analysis and I'm going to run this in every uh, 10 second steps. See how the plunger so the plunger started, the cycle started when the valve opens. So the plunger is coming up the surface and then the plunger remains there. That's the afterflow. And then the valve closes, the plunger falls one more time. So you can always play that at different point in time. And the, as this is a cycle, there is no one good picture. So when you when it comes to report, you have to pick what to print at what point during the cycle. Also the analysis plot. And again, you can here, you can change multiple variables to select on what to plot. But basically that was a very quick uh, plunger analysis in a real data set. Okay. Well, um, I have to switch now to gas wells and that's, a, that's, another, that's another topic we'd like to, we'd like to cover. Now let's... Uh, Let's dedicate the remaining up to the time uh, to talk about acoustic fluid levels in gas wells. At this point, uh, gas wells are pretty common. Multiple uh, offshore wells are producing as well gas 
not only gas wells, gas storage wells, uh, we have a uh, different type of examples. Um, ideally, talking about gas wells, one thing you have to understand is what is the gas flow in condition? Is your well producing any liquid? Is the gas flow velocity above or below the critical rate? And critical rate is a good topic uh, that you have to be aware if you're producing gas. Um, if the gas velocity may or may not have the capacity or the ability to remove the liquids from the well. When the gas flow rate is fast enough inside the tubing, it will remove those uh, liquid drops, maybe condensate, maybe water, that it has the ability to remove that out of the well. <clears throat> But when the pressure goes down or amount of liquid goes up, bottom hole pressure goes up, then inflow decreases, the gas flow velocity goes down. And after some point, it goes lows down to below the critical rate, which basically the gas loses the ability to remove liquids from the well. So you start having liquid loading problems. And so when you shoot a fluid level in the gas lift in the gas well, you have to be aware of are you producing above or below the critical rate and there are correlations some field correlations that use the pressure and the gas uh, production rate to estimate based on the tubing size if you are above or below the critical rate so turner plots are really common to use um, as, a, as a quick indicator if you're above or below the critical rate and then when you shoot the flu levels you will find out better details of that but you know what to expect so basically, when you have a liquid loading problem, there is just a, a, a liquid column in the well that remains in the well, and the gas just passes through the liquid, goes out of the liquid, and flows to surface. So that's a well having liquid loading problems. Obviously, that liquid column will generate a higher bottom hole pressure. So a producing bottom hole pressure is higher, less drawdown, less production. <clears throat> um, basically, it's a, it's a slug. Uh, flow of those gas bubbles through the liquid. So you can shoot a fluid level to determine the top of the liquid and use a regular S-curve correlation to calculate the liquid percentage in the tubing. And the software will calculate the bottom hole pressure very accurate with just a single shot as usual. Well, the process of determining bottom hole pressures in gas wells is different than any other pumping well or oil well. When you have an, a rod pump well, ESPs, PCPs, gas lift, even plunger lift, you normally rely on one single shot to determine bottom hole pressure. In gas wells, the reality is different. You normally have to shoot multiple times. It's recommended to actually shoot multiple times to determine producing bottom hole pressure. If the well is static, then that's fine. There is nothing, there's no need to shoot so many times, we normally recommend to shoot at least twice to understand what's going on to have a comparison point. But if the well is static or if the well is below the critical rate, like the one in the, in the slide, uh, a single shot is good enough to calculate bottom hole pressure. But when the well is flowing above the critical rate, then multiple shots are required to determine bottom hole pressure. And I will cover some of that in these slides. So uh, <clears throat> a good shot to perform also in gas wells is if you have a tubing, that's another thing. You may or may not have a tubing, but assuming you have a tubing, you take a casing shot because you are expecting to see the liquid level at the tubing intake or very close to it. If you don't see the flow level on the casing side at the tubing intake, then that represents normally a problem. The problem being a hole in tubing. When you look at this data, you can observe that the casing shot shows a flow level down at the Tubing intake, you can see an up kick, you can see the end of tubing, so you can see the perforation top, and you can see the fluid level at the end of tubing. That's what you're expecting to see in a casing shot in the producing gas well. <clears throat> the difference between tubing and casing pressure determines the amount of liquid in the tubing. I don't want to bore you with some uh, equations, but when you shoot down the tubing, what you're expecting to see is some liquid column in the tubing if your tubing pressure is less. So this, this example here, tubing head pressure was 82 PSI. Casing head pressure is 511 or 12 PSI. So there's a big differential pressure here. Well, the difference in here is that you have tubing fluid. You have liquid in the tubing. 
when you shoot the flow level down the tubing and you determine the tubing intake pressure down the tubing or down the casing, it should be the same or very similar. So what we have a tubing intake pressure calculation from the tubing shot is 650 APSI. The tubing intake pressure from the casing shot is very similar. So we're just a few PSI away, which means the tubing shot calculation was representative for this well condition. Um, but what if when you shoot a flu level in the casing, the flu level is not at the end of tubing? Then that's a problem that usually indicates two things. Either you have not uh, properly analyze the data and the flu level is not actually there, but deeper, or you don't see the liquid level and there's some, some uh, problem in the data analysis or in the data quality, or it, it may be just a hole in tubing because the, you have to make sure that if you don't see the, the liquid level at the tubing, it's actually somewhere above. You may have uh, a hole in tubing or you may have just a, an interpretation data problem there. <laughs> when you see a flu level is high in the tubing, what you can do is shut in the well, the, the pressure will accumulate, then the flu level present in the well will be pushed down and that will discover, that will show a kick in the well that represents the hole. So when you, if you have suspicious of, of a hole in tubing because you see a high liquid level in the casing, then you can shut in the well, push the liquid level down, expose the hole, and with additional shots, you will now see an up kick from the shot and a down kick from the liquid level. I have examples to show where we see a hole in tubing in a gas well. Hope we can get there for time. Let me move faster. So holes in tubing are uh, an unexpected but very common problem in gas wells. So lots of the, the production losses are due to Get holes in tubing and not necessarily to production uh, rate drops or, or uh, pressure drops or liquid accumulation in the well. Yeah, there are techniques to understand what's uh, what the well depth, um, but quick indicators is a, is a quick drop. You see natural uh, decline on the production and then all of a sudden, boom, it drops. And it drops to the point that the flow rate goes below the critical and then the, the well start accumulating liquid up to the whole depth, at least up to the whole depth. And then you can uh, identify that not only by looking at the production re records, but also by going and measuring the well, leading to recommendations of replacing the, the tubing and now going back to uh, gaining production. So it kind of waited a very long time where they, you could catch that with an echometer system in no time. So uh, using echometer equipment to find holes in tubing? Well, yes, you have now the dual shot technique. Well, let's see how single shots could help with that. But as you have echometer equipment, it's highly recommended to perform dual shots. Holes in tubing can be determined at this hole size. And the, the holes are not always visible at the very first shot. So sometimes take a few shots to allow the pressure to accumulate, to allow the tubing to dry better. And we can see at the first shot here, the, the hole was not visible. Probably they didn't use enough pressure in the shot. Then another shot, a slight small kick, not very good, was visible, but waiting some more, allowing the tubing pressure to increase, shooting down the casing, we can see an up kick. So now we can see an up kick on the casing, but everything changes when you go down the tubing. Down the tubing, you can see much, much more clear kicks. That will be a good up kick, good up kick representing uh, an up kick above the liquid level, normally a representation of a hole in tubing. So you can use the casing shots to determine the distance to that anomaly and confirm that with, a, with the tubing shots. I would highly recommend suspicion of that. You can always use a dual shot as a, a complementary information. Um, this is a, a, an example of a hole in tubing where the casing shot is showing that up kick right before the liquid level. So we'll have gained uh, some pressure. Both tubing and casing shots will represent the up kick at the hole depth. Okay, now uh, talking about shooting fluid levels in gas wells, and I highlight this in yellow saying, 
hit blue level on the, on the well until you understand, and that's important. Some people connect equipment, shoot once a couple of times quickly and leave the well. They don't even know where the liquid level is at, and they may not be a liquid level. If the well is flowing above the critical rate, there is just a mist flow in the tubing, and there is not such a gaseous liquid interface that they can send the pressure wave and reflect off that. So uh, shoot until you understand. Normally in a gas well, one shot is not enough. That's, that's what we normally see. Um, let's, uh, let's see some more information. So one of the quick ways out, of the out in the field, using field information to predict if you're uh, liquid loading or not, if you're producing below or above the critical rate using a chart like this, depending on the tubing size. Again, tubing head pressure and the gas flow rate you're getting from this well, you will have a, a quick idea if you're producing above or below the critical rate. And this example shows a 238 tubing. If you're above that, uh, once you consider the, the gas rate and the tubing pressure, then you should be in good shape, uh, not holding liquids. But if you're, if you're below, then it's very likely that you're uh, holding liquids. Liquid gradients in the well, uh, that vary. They're very light, this corner here, the below uh, what we say less than 20% liquid, below that, that's normally uh, above the critical rate. Liquid gradients above that, 0.09 PSI per foot, about 20 per, over 20%, you're getting to where you have liquid holding and it gets heavier and heavier until you have no more gas flow meaning that the well's dead and you have a 100% liquid column in the well. That's what you have also when, if you can keep some column if the well is static. So let's, let's talk about these uh, conditions. If you have a well that has high gas velocity, if you open the valve on surface, you could see something like a cloud. It's, it's, a, it's a mist flow. You don't have really at this point a gas, uh, liquid interface. So there is not such a top of the liquid. So if you shoot a fluid level right after shutting in the well, it's very likely that you will not see a liquid level. It will require some time, some multiple shots to see that. And, and now that's creating a liquid level top. And I say liquid level, but it's actually a, mainly gas at this point, but some, some liquid that you can see a more clear interface, gas and the liquid interface. So we'll see some examples of that. Uh, and, and calculating bottom hole pressure by using multiple shots in a well that is producing above the critical rate. So with that, this is a, a quick example and I will open the software to show some. This is a, a fluid level shot and additional fluid level shot and they are shooting fluid level very frequently. The first shot, you can barely see anything, but then after that, you can see a, a better or more clear liquid level kick. Uh, we recommend to shoot no more than five minutes in between and, and understand the first few shots, you may not be able to see anything. Now, once you have those shots, you will have to do some homework because this is what happened. The pressure is increasing and the software can calculate the pressure at the top of the liquid column or gaseous liquid column, which means that the pressure at the gas liquid interface and the depth that you, because you're basically pushing that down uh, while the pressure is increasing. So you can plot how the pressure increases versus the, the fluid level drop and estimate if you would be able to push that liquid all the way down to the formation, and this is, will be the well depth, what would be the pressure at the bottom of the well? So in this example at like 800 uh, for PSI. Let's look at a real example of that. Let's, let's open the software. And let's look at an example of this. So go to 10. And let's go to uh, producing bottle hole pressure in the gas well. We have an example here with multiple shots. And what we see here is uh, probably not the first shot, but we see a liquid level kick. We see a liquid level kick that's moving down. Look at how the time is increasing. And the fluid level is moving down, and the fluid level keeps moving down, and we have multiple fluid level shots. So we can even we can overlay. That's the last shot, previous shot, previous shot, and, and we can continue plotting the shots where you see that um, fluid level is going down. So let me. Okay. 
Okay. Well, something you can do with uh, the software is you can export the information by using an utilities portion of the software. You go to export data. And I will try to cover this very briefly. We have a video on how to do this. So if you request the information, we can send it to you. You can create templates on the information you want to export from the software. So that will be basically a template to calculate producing bottle hole pressure in the gas well, which I have included some information like the gaseous liquid interface pressure because the software calculate the pressure at the liquid level for you. We have tubing pressure, casing pressure, uh, liquid above the console, we have the kind of the submergency, and we can run this by um, selecting the wells that we want to analyze. So I'm going to unselect this, go into the online seminar real quick, and go to this reducing bottle pressure gas well. So with that, we can process because that's a, that's a well I want to analyze. And we have, we had a bad shot and we may see here in the background, but uh, most of the shots were okay. So you can always save this data and this will save that as a CSV file. It's, a, it's a basically a, like a database file and you can export multiple things from the software. But in this case, I just wanted some information to calculate a um, gas well fluid level uh, depression. So I have come up with, when you export that information to the CSV file, I have come up with this. So this is the data from that well, and we have tubing pressure that's measured. The software then calculates the pressure at the liquid level top. And with that information, the software also calculates the liquid level TBD, that is a, basically the distance to the liquid. If you know the distance to the liquid and you know the formation depth, so you know how much liquid you have, like how tall, how tall is that liquid column in the well? So you, you'll be measuring a liquid level from that point to the bottom, how much it is. And with that, we can plot what? How high is that column versus how much the pressure at the top of the liquid is. And we get a plot like this. So we have pressure increasing, which pushes the liquid level down. If we could be able to push the liquid level down all the way to the bottom, then the pressure at the bottom in this well will be about 536. Now I wanted to just to make it graphic for you because you can calculate that value based on the liquid level push. So this is a little bit of homework. We're planning to include these uh, capabilities in the software uh, down in the future. We, we're not actively working on it right now, but you can always determine bottle hole pressure. Why is that important? Because the producing bottle hole pressure calculated from every single shot is not correct. The software will, if you grab one single shot and click on the report, it will be calculating really high producing bottle hole pressure. That's not realistic. The software is not considering the right information to calculate the bottom hole pressure. So you should not use a single shot if you're producing above the critical rate. That's not the right way to do it. You will have a wrong calculation. What you should do is shoot multiple times. And in this case, seven flu level shots were enough to calculate a decent bottom hole pressure. According to the engineer, the pressure after we make the analysis, um, the pressure in this well should be around five and 600 feet, uh, so sorry, five and 600 PSI producing bottle hole pressure. That's uh, one thing you can do for calculating fluid levels and, and gas wells. Okay, <clears throat> another thing, this is uh, widely used in offshore wells, uh, tubing, uh, sorry, well integrity tests. So there is a very good chance that the well annulus, maybe the annulus B, annulus C is full of liquid or a very, very high liquid level. So when you shoot a fluid level, you may see some of this, um, we call it like a tornado shape, meaning that's a very sh short distance between liquid level peaks. What you see, the timing between here is actually the rebound of the liquid level peak. So it's a very shallow liquid level, uh, 
uh, about a quarter of a second, liquid level being less than 200 feet from surface. Even shallower look, liquid levels may be observed. And one more time, this is real data. Very short distance between echoes, meaning liquid level time is 0.1 seconds, so only a tenth of a second. The, the liquid level is just two joints from surface. That, that's all it is. So you have to be aware if you're shooting for a well integrity test, you may have a really high fluid level measurement. So sometimes you have that condition. Sometimes you have less gas flow velocity. Well, when you have a well that's holding liquid, then single shots will work okay. The software will change in time, but the pressure drop, sorry, the pressure increase and the liquid level drop will not be linear. You can do the same analysis and see how the fluid level drops, but it drops in a different rate. The fluid level drops real fast. So the pressure will be changing too quickly and you should only use the initial fluid level. That will be the most accurate one. The software will use the S curve to calculate producing bottle hole pressure. And if you compare that to a casing shot, which again, that should be, the liquid level should be very close to the casing intake. That's probably the best uh, thing to use for bottom hole pressure calculation. But if you don't have that, have only casing and monobore well, or you have a packer, you can use a casing shot, then doing it this way would be the way to go. The last thing I want to talk about before I go to the examples is when your well is shut in. And there is some misconception about shooting fluid levels in gas wells. And sometimes when people go and shoot the fluid level, the well is already static. Many of gas wells don't take very long to transition from producing to static state. So when, when people getting into the shooting fluid levels in gas wells, go and shoot a fluid level in a gas well that they just shot in. And the first few shots, they will not see good fluid levels if the well is producing above the critical rate. Then they say, well, when I stop the well, when I shut in the well and shoot the fluid level, I don't see anything. So they shut in the well and come back later the day or maybe the next day. That's way too long time. Normally the wells get from production to static, sometimes in a matter of an hour, sometimes in a few hours. Sometimes I've seen like a 45 minutes go from producing to static condition. So by the time you come back to the well and you shoot a fluid level, that's no longer a producing well. That's already static well. Well, you can use that information to calculate bottom hole pressure, but be aware, this is a static bottom hole pressure. That's a reservoir pressure calculation you're doing. And another thing about, or, or a consequence of that is the well has been shut in for a long enough time to push the liquid level back into the formation. Good thing, this is a really simple fluid level to analyze. But you may not be getting what you're looking for when you started to analyze the well. By the time you come back, it's a static fluid level shot. It's simple to analyze. But if you were looking for producing bottle pressure, you have to shut in and shoot multiple times in the short time intervals to be able to see how the gradient in the tubing behaves and use that information to calculate producing borehole pressure. Let's discuss the well shut in. There is no gas flow. So if you have any liquid, that will be a 100% liquid column present in the well, like the one in the picture. At this point, the fluid may be pushed back in the formation. So when you shoot a fluid level, you may see a dry well, completely dry. So you have no pressure in there. This example here, you have high casing head pressure over 200 PSI. There's a monobore well, there's no tubing in here. You see a liquid level at the formation and a high producing uh, reservoir pressure. So the well is static and there's just a small liquid column very close to the formation of 80, 88 feet. So it, all the rest of the liquid was pushed back into formation and the well is stable now is fairly simple to calculate bottom hole pressure because most of the pressure actually comes from the measurement at surface. Let's look at an example, a couple of examples of that. Um, here, let's look at uh, first a dry well. It's a low pressure monobore well, like the one in the picture. You can see here, um, liquid level is being measured 
you see an up kick and you're expecting to see that if the flu level is below the perforation. So as we have seen in day one and also Justin show downward marker, you can use the perforation top as a downward marker and calculate a good acoustic velocity and then a kick from the liquid level. So we know that all the liquid in this well is below the top of the perforation. Let me look at another well. Um, Oh, that's the one we had before. Oh, that this one here, static borehole pressure calculation. So this is a high pressure well. Pressure at surface is close to 4,000 psi. So it's 4,100 psi. As you can see, the pressure is not building up pressure anymore. The well is not building up pressure. So this is in a static state already. And we shoot a fluid level. We don't see colors because we're shooting down the tubing. We see a huge upkick. And let me zoom into this zone. And we see a big upkick that represents the end of tubing. We see another kick here. That's, a, that's actually the top perforation. And then you see a liquid level. So at this point, the liquid level, if there was any in the well, has been pushed back all the way into the well. And we can see a static pressure calculation, the pressure at the formation, whatever you told the software to calculate the pressure, is uh, close to 49, 43 PSI of pressure at the formation, in this case at 10,630 feet through vertical depth. It's really important if there was deviated, you input the deviation survey. But you have a bottom hole pressure calculation, a good liquid level determination, and most of the pressure at the bottom is, is just being a gas column, it's light, so you have over 4,000 PSI of well head pressure. For sure, we have been using a 5,000 PSI gas gun for this uh, test. Okay, um, back to the presentation. Have just a few more slides to show. Uh, with more, sorry, a few more examples to show. Um, <clears throat> let's see what else we have. We have. Um, let's see the gas wells uh, offshore. A common practice or, or or good use of the equipment is verify if the subsurface safety valve is working. Uh, countries with strong uh, safety regulations, uh, they install subsurface safety valve. This is almost a must for offshore operations. So this is a gas well offshore, and you have a well that has a tubing change in diameter. You shoot down the tubing. You see a kick from the, um, this in this case, you see in the background, the drawing and the subsurface safety valve. You see the change in diameter in the tubing. You can use that as a downward marker. And then you see a liquid level in the tubing present in this well. That's fairly simple. The purpose of this test is not only to make sure the fluid level, but actually see if when they activate the, the software of safety valve, it actually closes. So they went there and they continue shooting fluid levels and then shut the, the valve. So the soft surface safety valve and good things they're making comments subsurface safety valve is closed. So now you shoot a fluid level and the wave does not go beyond the subsurface safety valve. So you see like a liquid level kicks because it's a total blockage and you see repeats of that and nothing else. So the subsurface safety valve actually closed and this was a 14 minutes in between these two shots. Then you shoot again and they just shot again to have a confirmation, but you can also use the annotations previous shots to overlay uh, as open and a close. So you, so you can confirm or see the difference at least if you have those two shots there. So you have the open subsurface safety valve shot where you can see down in the well to the bottom to the liquid level. And you just see here to the subsurface safety valve, a confirmation that the well is uh, working properly or, or the subsurface safety valve is working properly. <clears throat> a well with hole in tubing, that's an interesting one. When you shoot the well down the tubing, you see an up kick. And the software may have a, a liquid level selection, but actually we have discussed about liquid level reflections. You see an up kick and you should see a repeat of that. But as up kicks are enlargement, which is inverting polarities, this kick at 3.28, that would be at 6.50 something that so this actually isn't a repeat 
have that hole in tubing. That's a hole in tubing. Repeat, and we can make a note. Actually, the liquid level is a bigger kick down here. So you have a hole in tubing and the time to that point, and you, you can use a reference point and a depth reference line. You see about 3.3, .3, so 6.6 .6 or so, we have a repeat of that. That's good. Yeah, that's a repeat of this. And if we have 3.3, .3, so like a 9.9, .9, we may see up, down, up. So this is actually all in tubing take on repeat. So we, we can observe those things if we have enough pressure and we care about that, but actually the liquid level may be what we were looking for or a reason why the well, so the well failed, this is the liquid level distance. That's in the tubing shot. Another tubing shot, pretty much same results. Now liquid level has been properly selected. Now go to the casing side. And when you go to the casing, do a shot and you see the up kick. Well, you see the up kick on the casing shot you see the app kick on the two me shot. So meaning you can overlay those two shots. And if you use the ref reference line, you see the app kick in the two me shot, blue line, and the casing shot, black line, actually overlay. Confirmation of a hole in tubing. Down kicks as a repeat. Liquid level is the same because you have communication bottom and top. So the pressure distributes equally in tubing and casing resulting in the same liquid level in tubing and casing side. So by shooting some fluid levels real quick, and after that you can follow up with a uh, dual shot if you want, it's a confirmation of having a problem in the well, a clear hole in tubing. Well, um, we have just a few more minutes for questions. Justin, if we have any questions, those are the examples I wanted to show today. Yeah, absolutely. So we have had a few questions come in. I've been trying to answer several of them as we've been going along, just to make the most of our uh, question and answer time. You know, what I'll do is I'll start off answering um, or asking questions that were stated during the gas lift presentation and therefore a little bit after, and then in the dual shot, and then we'll go into plunger lift as well as um, the, the gas well presentation as well. So the first question, question that we have is where do I put in the mandrel depths? And so what we're going to do is I'm going to share my screen and I'm gonna open up TAM and I want to demonstrate where we would put in the mandrel depths. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go up here to where I have my multi-kicks gas lift number one, well example, which we showed and where you put in your mandrel drips, whenever you go in and you create a well, you remember from the first day, we went in to pick a well and create, in which we were able to pick our well template. However, if you want to change your mandrel depths, the easiest way to go in and do it is to go to the edit tab in the individual well that you have picked. We're going to go into the edit tab, and the gas lift mandrel depths are going to be under the lift system. And so from lift system, you can go in and ultimately put in the corresponding mandrel depths. And as you put in the depths, and watch, I'll take one away. Let's just delete row. It will ultimately adjust the image, um, no longer having that depth there. If I want to add a row, let's just say that I put, put the uh, gas lift mandrel back in, I'll add a row and then tie in that gas lift mandrel and click save, and then my mandrels will be will be there and will ultimately appear. And so that's the way that you can add them in. Now, the second question that we had was, I'm currently using side pocket mandrels, and they're nine feet long. Do I enter in the top or the bottom? And in reality is you can enter in the top and the analysis will function just fine for the side pocket mandrels. And so I hope that answers your question. Utilizing the top of the side pocket mandrel will be just fine for entry. Yeah, that's when that's where the pocket begins, right at the top yeah. of the mandrel. So that's an enlargement when you see yeah. an up kick or a down kick, if you're shooting down outside, is is the increase or decrease in the cross-sectional area at the top of the mandrel. Yep, yeah, for sure. 
So the next question that we're going to go into, and I think this question was kind of answered already because, um, you know, you went through the plunger lift presentation and talked about how to optimize and ultimately use the information um, to optimize a plunger lift cycle. This question was, can we determine how to adjust our cycle based on tracking a plunger? Sure. That's the main purpose of it. Yeah. Uh, but when you, when, go ahead. No, and what I was going to say is you ultimately use that, you know, you're tracking the fall velocity of the plunger as it falls through the gas and ultimately hits the liquid level and then rests on the bumper spring. But how do I optimize my cycle times? Well, if you notice that your valve stays closed for 30 minutes while the plunger is resting on bottom, that's lost time. And so you can determine when to open the valve if you need to open it sooner um, and ultimately optimize that cycle time. You can also use that to see if the plunger, did the plunger even reach bottom prior to the valve opening? So you can definitely use that tracking cycle in order to optimize the overall plunger lift cycle on your conventional plunger lift well. You have anything to add to that, Gustavo? Do we have any, uh, do we have any other questions? Um, can you still hear me, Gustavo? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, in this one, this last question that we have, this was kind of interesting because I think we could have some fun with this one um, and, you know, talk a little bit more in depth. So one person asked, if, a, if, if we have uh, plunger lift wells in which we run gas lift valves, okay, so more of a gapple scenario, it says, when we, when we analyze a plunger cycle, can we look at the signatures from the tubing and casing pressure and fall velocity, and as the plunger passes an open gas lift valve, can we identify that leaking valve? Now, are there any tri or tri tricks or tips for evaluating plunger traces in gas lift wells? Now, one of the things that I wanted to talk about, and Gustavo chip in on this too, because yep. It's, it's something that we can expand and evaluate. But if you have gas lift valves and you drop a plunger and the plunger pulse falls past the open valve, sure, I could see where you would see, and, and the check is open as well, or the hole in tubing, you would see where the plunger passed that valve. But I don't believe that your plunger would continue cycling if you had a valve that was stuck open up hole because that would become your injection point and the plunger would fall past that point. Yeah, another condition, I don't know if this is specific for a gapple well, but uh, if not, if it's just a gas lift well, I have pulled an example here where we can see based on the uh, shape, and this is a perfect candidate for the door shot to confirm that. Let me share my screen here. So I have on the screen right now, this flu, this, uh, flu level shot, this is a an offshore gas lift well, where you can see mandrel, this is a side pocket mandrel as usual, offshore. You see peaks from the mandrel depth. So you see from top to bottom, one, two, three mandrels, but I'm going to make this more opaque so we can see the shape of those kicks. You see kind of a double kick, a double kick, a double kick, and then a single kick, then double kick again. That's normally an indication of a problem in this valve. We have observed that multiple times uh, during the door shot. So this valve very likely, I would bet this valve is open and we can confirm that by doing uh, shooting a door shot. Uh, the flu level may come up to this point eventually if the, the reservoir has enough energy, but if you shoot a casing shot, very likely that liquid accumulation will reach that point. Yeah. And so, you know, and then, and we can definitely expand more on that, um, you know, as far as tips and tricks for evaluating um, gap -O wells, you know, the, the challenge with tracking a, a gap -O well is that the valve opens before the plunger is on bottom. And with the microphone, it's an acoustic tool. And so there's a lot of noise. Uh, one of the things that we're working on is we're looking working on ways to filter that acoustic data so that we can ultimately use the acoustic reflections in order to count collars, even though the valve is open and gas is continuing to flow. We're working on that. 
Uh, one other method that you could use is you could actually, we've seen it where you could use, um, you can use the casing pressure. Um, you can use your tubing pressure to determine when potentially that plunger has actually reached bottom. And let's just say you can't see the acoustic reflections, but as the plunger is falling through the, the gaseous fluid column and ultimately rests on bottom, now the injection pressure is having to increase in order to lift that plunger in that sludge surface. And so you see your casing pressure start to increase. And so there's different things that we're working on and continue to, it, it's, it's in the development stages, uh, definitely with tracking gaffle plungers uh, with the echo meter equipment. And I hope we answered that question. Uh, fi finally, the last question that we'll leave on is, let me go up here and find it real quick. Yeah, uh, the last question was about gas storage wells. They asked, do we have any experience dealing with gas storage wells? And the answer is yes. And could we potentially provide some examples of fluid level shots on gas storage wells? Actually, I think one of the shots that I show was actually from a gas storage well. Um, yeah, it's, it's widely used uh, for gas storage fields or companies that they do that as a service. Um, there is not much of a difference. Normally, gas storage wells are fairly simple to analyze. Uh, they understand about their gas composition. So if we go to a shot and that, we covered how to calculate the distance to the liquid level day one by using the last method three acoustic velocity and entering the gas composition uh, in this particular well. Sometimes you, you, if you do have liquid level going up, because let's say you have a sell the gas already and liquid levels go up, low pressure at this point, you should have fluid level down the casing. There is no tubing, for example, you know, an example I want to recreate, uh, you have just a liquid level kick. Simple kick, you enter the gas uh, composition, you have a good accurate um, bottle hole pressure calculation based on the liquid level measurements. Um, at, at higher points, lower liquid levels, same thing, you, you, you always have a good ability to determine distance to liquid and gas storage well, either because you see some of the perforations, you see end up tubing, or if you have any of that, you normally know enough good information to use the method three gas composition to determine distance to liquid and use that to calculate bottom hole pressure, which is their primary goal. I think that takes us to the end of the session, does it? Yeah, I mean, that was the last question. Um, one of the things that we're going to do, guys, is that um, it appears that the data that we sent out with the invitation yesterday or last night, um, it did not pro it did not carry over all of the TAM files. And so we will make sure we get all of those TAM examples that we used during today's presentation and make sure that we send them to you. And so okay. I just want to I just want to thank you all for joining. Uh, we appreciate everyone. Uh, jumping in and, and learning with us as we went through these presentations. And if you have any questions like we directed you to, uh, feel free to email Gustavo or myself at any given time, uh, justin at echometer.com or gustavo at echometer.com. Uh, we will send out these presentations this afternoon that will also have the email addresses in there as well. So we enjoyed spending time with you guys and we hope to see you next year. Thank you. Thank you.